Look at that intro. Look, look at that intro. <laughs> hopefully. I always say hopefully at the beginning of the stream, like it's going to break one of these days. Fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, but hopefully, if I've done everything right, you have seen three amazing intros, and you are now looking at... Good intro, says Ailing. Okay, yeah, solid. Nailed it. Uh, you are now looking at the Fall of Magic stream setup for level one adventuring. I'm going to turn off my side camera so I don't look at myself because I am a vain human and that will be far too distracting. Uh, hello, welcome. I am your host and game master, Wolf Scott. Uh, you are watching level one adventuring. Hopefully you are a returning viewer and one of our uh, esteemed friends like Ailing in the chat. Uh, and if you are... Thank you for being here again. And if you are new, uh, welcome. What are we? Who is Level 1 Adventuring? Uh, we are primarily a role-playing game channel, both like tabletop role-playing games as well as some video game role-playing games. We do a lot of different types of content. We have an ongoing 5th edition D&D campaign, which normally runs Wednesdays, which is today, last time I checked. Uh, but when we can't get the full head count, when we gotta spice things up, we like to try different games. And so tonight... What you're going to be watching is Fall of Magic. This is a collaborative storytelling game uh, by Heart of the Unicorn, Deernicorn, sorry, Heart of the Deernicorn Games, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and it's primarily just a means by which uh, friends can um, improv with each other in a fantastical environment and explore a world, but we're stapling some extra role-playing rules on top because we like rolling dice. Uh, and that is essentially what you're going to watch tonight with us. Uh, you know, grab a snack, stick around. Uh, one of the normal things that I have to plug, uh, thank you, uh, Tabletop Audio, for giving us, um, and many role-playing game channels, uh, free uh, uh, use audio for all of their adventures. Thank you, Streamspell and Streamlabs, for all of the awesome digital effects you've seen, like those intros, which were called out. Um, and uh, if you'd like to, we have a, uh, what do you call it, affiliate link in the bottom. Upgrade your own stream, so help us out. Uh, and then finally, uh, check out all of our other socials. The YouTube uh, is growing, and we could definitely uh, appreciate your help there. I started posting some things to TikTok, which I feel wholly unprepared for. Uh, but they're pretty, you know, they, they, they make you giggle. Um, and the Discord. The Discord is where we um, talk about what games we're going to plan next. We trade memes and fan art. And we have some other long-term plans for gaming there as well. So I hope you will join and have fun with us there. Uh, but with that being said, I just talked a lot, and I would love for my friends and fellow gamers and game masters to introduce themselves. So, you know, take it away. Take it away, y'all. I'll go first, because I rolled to go first. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good logic, yeah. But we'll get there. I'm Garrett. Uh, I am playing um, Vago, the um, Golem of Ravenhole, in this. Follow a magic campaign anyway. Normally on the stream, I play Yoan Byrne, our um, tiefling sorcerer. Wizard. Oh my god, he's a wizard. <laughs> is he? Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, What's going to happen is. when we roll again? It's been so long. Anyway, go on. Hey, y'all. What's up? Uh, my name is Amber. Tonight, I will be playing Sully, the giant of Mistwood. I almost forgot my name, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's been a mile, y'all. Um, but normally, I play Nadara Valir on our level one adventuring D&D uh, &D campaign. Um, and yeah, happy to be here tonight. It's been a minute. And uh, yes. Also, I, oh. shout out to, was it Ailing who did the Nadara chibi fan art? Uh, yes, I believe it was. Absolutely. Yeah. So. <laughs> Ailing in chat right now. She says, oh, oh, thank yeah. you. It was amazing. <laughs> uh, oh, and uh, Ailing also says, I miss Yoan. Aw. Well, don't I'm worry. with Yoan too. <laughs> you won't have to miss them for very long. We'll be we'll be back on track very very soon. Um, and yeah. I guess I should introduce uh, myself as well in terms of uh, who I will be in this game at any rate. So you well know I'm Wolf Scott. I'm I'm the game master typically for uh, for level one adventuring. But in this game, since we are all game masters and we are all player characters, uh, I play Caspian Rain, a sort of Possibly disgraced knight, uh, definitely thief, uh, and fortune teller, uh, seer of the stars. Um, so, I guess uh, we should probably talk a little bit about where we have been and, and where we're going, uh, and then we can pick up from where we left off. So, premise of Fall of Magic in a nutshell 
is uh, the player characters, or the players assume three player characters, which you kind of create out of a bunch of different name prompts, which are featured on this sort of far side of the map over here. If we uh, take a look at the wonderful digital resources provided by Heart of the Deernicorn uh, for specifically for World 20, which is pretty cool. Um, you generate a character from these name prompts, uh, and you're placed on this map. Which, by the way, I actually got my physical... I ordered both the digital and physical version of this game. The digital, of course, came automatically. Uh, but I actually... There was a problem with my mailing address for my physical version. And so it told me it was delivered and it never came. And then I messaged them and it had a return address and all this stuff. So I actually just got it, um, maybe three days ago. And it's so pretty. The map is... It's just so cool to actually unroll a physical like cloth map and there's like all the different locations and it's like very tactile and very pretty so big shout outs for uh for heart of the deernicorn games for the quality of that uh but essentially you create a character uh you assign them a little token which in the physical version release are actually like full metal coins once again beautiful uh and you place them over here on raven hall now uh, the whole purpose of Raven Hall is that it's the sort of base of operations for a additional player character known as the Magus, right? And the Magus is collectively controlled by everyone in the party. They're sort of a character that at any time uh, a person can assume the role of. Usually you trade control of the Magus in between rounds. Uh, but the whole premise of the game is that the Magus starts in Raven Hall. And for some reason, which we have yet to discover, or we've yet to create with one another yet, uh, magic in this world is dying. And with it, uh, this very powerful magic user, who has been a great boon to the world, is also fading. And our responsibility is to escort them and assure their safety to this other location, on, presumably on the other side of the map, uh, known as Umbra, the, the realm where magic was born, I believe, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, and so everyone takes turns moving their token on the map, picking a location as marked on the map, and then role-playing through and narrating and improv scenes based off of the prompts listed on those locations. And, I mean, really, that's the long and short of it. Um, it the, the way this game is designed initially, if you're just playing it out of the box, there's no dice rolls, there's no mechanics for, like, fights or challenges. It's really just a means to inspire you and your friends to be able to storytell together, to improv with one another, to make believe with one another, essentially, within the confines and bounds of this, you know, space. Uh, but because I'm difficult, and uh, <laughs> I knew my players would probably want to roll some extra dice, uh, I stapled some extra roleplay mechanics on here, borrowed from Rhesus. Rhesus? Rhesus? The Anything RPG, which I believe is a free PDF uh, that you can just find online. Uh, and it gives you like some very bare bones but very straightforward role-playing mechanics that you can use for a bunch of different stuff. Any genre, really. Uh, and so that's that's what we're doing. Um, where we left off, so to, to make... And uh, Amber and Garrett, uh, please, if I misspeak or misremember, or you want to assume agency over the story and sort of, you know... Uh, what's the word? Rewrite, you know, retcon, anything that might have been established that we don't want to keep moving forward. Please let me know. Uh, but the and interject if you if you would like. Um, but as far as I remember, uh, we all met at Raven Hall. To uh, can I drop links in chat? Let's find out. Yes, you can. Oh, Vorpal nailing it with the with the oh it, drive through RPG. Nice, very well done. Um, we started at Raven Hall to meet the Magus. The Magus in our world who we've created is this very interesting... Um, they, they sort of appeared in the world during a cosmic realignment. They're this shape-shifting, non-binary. They look kind of young and... and um, uh, and they're covered in, in in furs and bones. They kind of have a very primeval garb about them. Uh, and, and their personality is sort of, um, they teach indirectly, sort of harsh lessons, you know. They're, they're not one to overplay their hand and outright instruct someone. They kind of let them learn their, their own harsh lessons with, you know, as much guidance as they can give, at least verbally. Uh, we were all summoned to Raven Hall because it turns out in previous moments in our lives, uh, we had somehow came across the Magus, you know, in various different ways and, and forms, and we kind of got roped into 
uh, being uh, at their sort of summons in the future. Uh, and so today the Magus was finally calling in that favor, for, or, or in some cases not so much a favor. Uh, won't let us have a bar fight. Uh, the Magus was willing to let you have a bar fight, was just hoping that you would make the better choice before <laughs> they had to let you learn it yourself. Uh, and luckily the party did, so look at that growth, expansion, personal development, we love to see it. Um, so we all got summoned to Ravenhall, found out magic was dying and that we were all needed to help uh, the mages get to the other side. We were all important for some reason, of course, that's all a mystery to us. Uh, we travel through the Oak Hills, we see firsthand how magic is kind of fading from the world. We get into a fight with a bandit and some uh, hunting dogs who we very thoroughly uh, throw back into the wilderness. Um, have a couple of scenes together where we're talking about our our morals and our and our obligations and our and our feelings about the mages in this quest. We get to Barley Town. Uh, Barley Town's sort of like this first big settlement that we see on the map, other than Ravenhall. Uh, and a lot of stuff happens. Yeah, uh, to Loki's point, we go to a bar. <laughs> it's a very uh, uh, heartwarming scene, I'd, I'd say. Although there were like some terse moments with a with a a bard singing a, a, a couple songs on the stage. Uh, we also went to the market, and uh, Caspian stole some supplies while charming uh, a vendor with a uh, Vago close at hand. Uh, and then what else did we do there? We got, uh, we stole something. Oh, and then on our way out, uh, we got stopped by the guard, and the guard told us that the Barley Lord, uh, the, the person in charge of this place, really wanted to see us, really wanted to speak with us. Uh, and so we got called to their chambers, and pretty much the Barley Lord uh, was kind of poke. I don't want to say poking fun, but maybe uh, maybe being a little harsh to the maid just because they live so close, and yet they've never really blessed the Barley uh, town with their presence, uh, and it's kind of left them to fend for themselves. So it's kind of giving them a little tongue wagging about that. Uh, but eventually the mage just relented and said that they would return uh, and make good on their on their proximity uh, once magic was restored to the realm, which seemed to please the Barley Lord. Uh, and also gave Vago a, a, a shit ton of coins, gold coins, uh, which I think Vago <laughs> promptly shoved into their rocky carapace as like a makeshift pocket. Um, and that is kind of where... I remember the the wide beats of our story ending, if I'm correct, gang. Does that sound about right? I think that sounds about right. Sounds about right? Sounds right to me. All right. So if that's the case, uh, we rolled ahead of time onto where, who is going to be taking, you know, first, second, third rolls to choose our scenes and whatnot. And uh, Vago, rolled uh to be the first to choose a scene however if i'm not mistaken uh vago you're you're feeling a little uh, trepidatious about making this choice given the current map situation is that right so i think my upstairs neighbor's bowling um <laughs> well i'm a little trepidatious because our next we're at our first crossroads mm -hmm. and the two places we're choosing between are the storm guard mountains that caspian hails from and the mistwood that solly hails from yeah um, so what I'm going to ask, I think, this is how I'm going to decide. I think you two should each tell me, of your homeland, mm -hmm. what is the danger that we are likely to face? Ooh. If we go that Ooh. way. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. So, so is this is is this you asking us in character, or is this uh, you asking sort of? Yeah, we'll we'll say we're we're standing at the crossroads, mm -hmm. and the there there's been some already some some voiced like we should go this way, we should go this way. No, no, no. Uh, and the archmage has turned to Vago and said, "You don't seem to have a horse in this race, Vago. Why don't you decide?" <laughs> and Vago says. Mm -hmm. Danger both ways. <laughs> what dangers, friends? Uh, and Caspian uh, sort of shoots a cross glance at Vago because at this point, I don't know. I don't believe that Caspian has outright said where he hails from. 
but during the bar scene, he he did seem particularly vexed by a song, which uh, we know is is part of the culture of Stormguard. Uh, and so he'll he'll narrow his steely eyes at Vago and say, uh, "You just gonna assume I'm from Stormguard? You got you you, you want to tell me why you think you know so much about me, there, Vago?" Vago's gonna turn to the arch, gonna point to the archmage and go, "He tell me." <laughs> Vago did not know, but now Vago do know. <laughs> When Archmage <laughs> Hail Vago. Uh, and, uh, Caspian then shifts his gaze over to the Archmage, uh, or the Magus, I should say, uh, and says, Ah, oh, well, of course, you know, if we're just going to be magically transmitting information, uh, personal <laughs> information, uh, between all of us, of course, yeah, I, I, I don't know why I didn't think of that. Absolutely. Very good. Very good practice. Uh, okay, well... Uh, Stormguard, you know, it is known for, obviously, the perilous mountain tracks, uh, the near-constant pounding rain, uh, deadly lightning storms, to name a few things. Uh, you know, there's, of course, some beasts which will haunt the stones and try to gobble up passes by. Also, uh, you know, the Stormguard themselves are, uh, you know, a capable lot of uh, well-armored knights who wield blades which are enchanted with lightning. So, you know, I would probably not cross them if I were you. Would probably be a bad idea. Uh, but just, just to name a couple things. Uh, they also are uh, entirely uh, iron-fisted in their methodology. Uh, and they will absolutely abuse their power. Uh, if you give them a chance. So, just gonna throw that out there, and, um, you know, yeah, just your normal everyday stuff. This is not, not every day for Vago, but... <laughs> That's also what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone's gonna have to get acquainted to it real quick, it seems like, so, uh... I don't know, Sully, what about you? What are, what are we going to expect if we go waltzing our way into the Mistwood? Well, you know, uh, Mistwood is a thick forest. There's lots of wildlife and beasts, but most of them won't bother you. Um, things to look out for are probably poachers and bands of looters and things like that that often hide within the forest. Mm -hmm. Um, what else? Um, nighttime can be a little scary. Uh, you know, bad people like to hide out in places where people don't go often. So, you know, I have never seen them and I've never come across them, but I've heard tales of necromancers that do terrible things to dead people in the forest. Um, but I've never seen them, but I've just heard of it. Uh, my parents didn't let me go out at night for that reason. Um, other than that, it's it's kind of a lovely place. I haven't been in a while, though. Yeah, it sounds absolutely charming, Sully. Thank you. Especially the necromancer part. That was my favorite. It That's was favorite. Vago's favorite, too. <laughs> Shared <laughs> interest. We have good track record with looters. We mm -hmm. do not have any track record with lightning and storm guard lords. I, agree. I am thinking perhaps the the mistwood is the best. Uh, seeing you kind of leaning in the direction of mistwood, you can see there's sort of a a visible wash of relief that that rolls across Caspian. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Storm God, bad news. Yeah, don't, why, why bother, you know? Uh, so, uh, I say, yeah, we just march on straight through the, the, the dead, spooky, haunted forest. I think that definitely sounds safer and, and good for all of us. You agree. It's good. <laughs> I mean, Caspian, I'd love to go to the place that made you the way that you are. Maybe there's more of you. Trust me, Sully, there is only one Caspian Rain. They could not handle another. 
they couldn't even handle one. Why <laughs> 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 in there? To Misswood? Uh, so I guess it's off to the Mistwood, isn't it? Off to the Mistwood, yes. Uh, all right. Only has like a pep in her step as she's still walking <laughs> toward Mistwood. <this> <laughs> Where's Bago? Yeah, we're all sort of uh, clustered here. I guess we'll we'll just go right up to Mistwood. How the road changes. Ooh, okay. That feels mm -hmm. like it's got some potential. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like we can make that a scene unto itself. All right, let's see. I think everybody is invited. Okay. To find out how the road changes. Oh, yes, and that's something uh, we should let chat know again. Uh, when the storyteller, when the person's turn is up, the storyteller uh, not only controls their character and the mages, but they have the ability to invite or uninvite um, as many members of the party as necessary for they feel for that scene that they want to have. You know, so they can start the scene with everybody and gradually remove them or possibly add other people later, depending on how they want the scene to go. So they kind of be, get to play director. Uh, in that sense, and time is also really wobbly. Things don't have to happen sequentially. Uh, it's kind of whatever the, you know, the storyteller feels in that moment is going to serve the story best. So, uh, that's just a little tidbit there as Garrett decides that we are all invited to how the road changes. All right, um... I'm a little torn because there's part of me that's thinking it's my scene and we, I should introduce it, but I also feel like I don't, I don't want to take it away from Amber. Uh, no. Would you be comfortable, Amber, describing how the road changes yeah. between here and the Mistwood? Absolutely. Um, so as we, you know, leave Barley Town and head into Mistwood, the the paved or stone streets slowly turn into um, uh, like a dirt path that's well tread. Um, we start getting uh, encompassed by thicker and thicker forests. Um, the city sounds that you kind of hear from Barley Town kind of fade away, and they're replaced with that like scenic, serene, like nature quiet. You you hear like a little stream off to the side. You hear birds chirping. Uh, you hear the slight whisper of the breeze. Um, things like that. Um, it is almost eerily quiet from what we just came from, um, but it also brings a sense of serenity. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just a really beautiful forest landscape um, that is not very well traversed. Like the path we're on now is pretty much the only path you'll see. Everything else is just going to be untread nature. Uh, Caspian has, I imagine, never been to any real forest, <laughs> let alone well, cause, <laughs> kills were kind of a forest, but not like this. This feels like an entirely different beast. Um, so I think Caspian is sort of maybe unceremoniously, not like officially, but like definitely in uh, his own way. Oh, uh, Ailing's going to be lurking. Ailing will be happy to have you whenever you're around. <laughs> happy lurking. Um, I think Caspian is sort of like one hand on the hilt of his very resplendent sword. Um, and... He's walking, like, next to Solly, but, you know, somewhat slightly behind <laughs> Solly, like, maybe a, maybe a step or two behind, just, like, a, a slightly in her shadow, uh, kind of letting her take point through this very sort of alien terrain to him, especially as, like, the, the forest gets thicker and the, and the mist starts whipping up. Um, so, uh, Solly, not to, uh, you know... Uh, assume that you might, I don't know, lead us into some sort of death trap or, you know, animal den or something, but you do know where you're going, right? This place, uh, I can't make heads or tails of it. Oh, uh, yeah, for the most part. I, I have been all through Mistwood. I didn't normally stay by this road we're walking, though, so I don't know this area well. You know, giants don't really like to be where people can see them, so I know the deeper forest a lot better than I know this area. You know, the paths are kind of dangerous, you know. 
Yeah, it's the mostly no part that gives me, you know, just a <laughs> bit of pause. Um, I mean, I haven't been here in a while since mm -hmm. we've been, you know, on our grand adventure. So Absolutely. I don't know how things have changed, but, you know, I assume it's the same old Bisswood I grew up with and I know. Hopefully. Right. Yeah, the same one with the, <laughs> with the dead people. Yes. Okay. Just making sure we're all... I, I look behind my shoulder just so we're all on the same page. So, okay. But apparently the dead people don't come out until nighttime, so we should be fine for a couple of hours. What a relief. And they also, I've never the seen them. Oh, well. That must mean maybe they're not real. No. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, I think Vago is, is trailing behind a little bit with um, the Archmage transformed into yet some other bird uh, perched on his shoulder. Uh, I don't know, what's a mist woody bird? What is a mist woody mm. bird? An, an owl. owl? It's an owl. Oh, oh wow, wow. Well, we said that was yeah, the exact same time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we all know it, let's just say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Loki uh, says swallow, also a good bird. But I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, fe I felt like we just knee jerked like right into Owl so hard though. So I, I feel like, yeah. But you know what? We'll keep Swallow in the back of our brains because that's a good one too. For the next place. For our next place. Mm -hmm. So the Archmage is just sitting on Vago's shoulder doing the full 180 neck thing. <laughs> Checking front, back, and all sides. For is it like constantly turning? Like very slowly? Like. <laughs> No, I think not not like a like a little owl bot, like but just like <laughs> just kinda like Oh, I was like thinking about for some reason while. I thought you meant Vago's head was doing that. Oh no. <laughs> Which I was like, it could do that. Vago's right. just like eyes ahead, mm -hmm. let's just focused on the you know. All that biz. Mm. Uh, Sally is almost skipping ahead, just kind of really happy, real comfortable, kind of humming a song to herself, looking around. Uh, occasionally she'll see like, uh, like a deer that looks familiar and go, hi, hello! <laughs> and just, she's just <laughs> waving to everything, this childlike glee. Like, there's definitely some other animal that comes up. I'm gonna say it. One of those deer that she says hi to, that Bago also goes, <laughs> hello! And the deer just <laughs> bolts. <laughs> don't take that personally. I don't think he's used to seeing um, automatons. I don't know. What would you call yourself, Fago? <laughs> Econ struck. Can I take deer mannerisms personally? If not person? Deer Structurally, <laughs> maybe? <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. I like, I see everyone like, <laughs> like, <laughs> drill their eyes at me. I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did Caspian just make a joke? Oh yes, because I am completely <laughs> humorless and devoid of any means of entertaining myself or others. Thank you, Sally. Thank you for the reminder. Is okay. That was the we first time I've heard you, you be funny. <laughs> Caspian, that was the first time I've seen you try to be funny that wasn't completely sarcastic, so I applaud you. I tr yeah, that I tried to be funny or that I was funny? Oh, no, you were funny. I definitely chuckled and it came from my gut. <laughs> uh, despite all of the the, the nervousness of, of, of creeping through this forest, there is a there is a, a slight crack uh, of, a, of a smirk at the end of, of Caspian's lips uh, as, as he gets that compliment from Sully. Oh, pass the smiles in the chat. Like Joe says, cracking his smile. Uh oh, uh, what's up, Joe? Wait, what did you miss? Uh, we're just uh, tr we're getting into it. Really, we're in the forest. We're figuring it out. Uh, but what, sorry, Amber, what did you say? No worries. Um, I was saying that Sully notices the slight smile on Caspian's face, and she's just like beaming with pride that he's smiling, but she's not going to say anything. <laughs> right, of course not. <laughs> she doesn't yeah. want to ruin the moment. <laughs> So, uh, what do y'all think of the forest? I know both of y'all haven't spent a lot of time here. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's certainly very green. Uh, that's a word for it. Um, and 
I don't know, there's something about not seeing anybody else, which just, I don't know, I'm used to being in a, on a busy street corner or like in an alleyway. I'm always in earshot from someone, you know, and that someone is usually, you know, a person who I can hmm. anticipate, I can understand to a degree, but hmm. it's just a little too quiet. Uh, I don't know. I I don't know what that thing's thinking. I, I point to like to like a random critter which is like scurrying through <laughs> through the brush. I don't know what what's going on over there. It's um, I don't know. It's a little unsettling, but I don't know. I, nothing nothing I can't get through. Mm. I think, is many wood. I think that's interesting. Good. Is is many wood and much mm. meat. So, Lots of mist. <laughs> he's comforting to find the expected in the mist wood. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that that does hold <laughs> uh, a surprising <laughs> amount of wisdom. Actually, that does, uh, Vago. Thank you for that. <laughs> when you think of it that way, absolutely. I don't know what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, I think you'll both find this to be really nice. I think you're going to want to spend more time in the woods after Miss Wood. I hope it changes your mind. And Caspian, to your point about not, you know, expecting things and knowing how to read, if you just pay close enough attention, you can definitely tell what the creatures and the critters around you are feeling. You can tell if a something is going to charge at you, like say they put their ears backward or they show their teeth. Most of it's just a warning telling you that they don't like what you're doing. You know, just pay attention the same way that you look at people when you know you can swindle them. I guess so. I feel like uh, with animals, though, they at least come by it honest, the way you put it. With humans, sometimes you got to do a little more digging, you know? They'll say something, they'll act a certain yeah. way, but inside their hearts, twisted round opposite. Yeah. And to me, that sounds like you'd be an expert here, because you're so used to deception, right? <laughs> I guess that depends on if uh, animals come by honesty as well as humans do, uh, which it sounds like it might mm. be uh, a little harder for me to manage. We'll see. Do y'all want to see my favorite berry patch? I yeah. thought you would never ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're actually uh, up next to pick the scene, right, Amber? Oh, yeah, that's true. Is it me? I mean, I rolled the one. I think oh, I you rolled the one. one. But, well, but, then, but you know yeah, what? I kind of right. like your impulse, though. If, if you want to go... Uh, <laughs> well, that's something. what I was going to say, is we can place the berry patch in one of those next. Yeah. Uh, one of these Mistwood scenes. Yeah. Good. Well, I'll let you pick and I can just describe a berry patch when we come across it. Mm. Oh, man. They're, which one am I going to choose, though? Going to swindle a squirrel? Yeah, we're going <laughs> to... I'm going to see how many <laughs> nuts I can get off of this guy. He's got, yeah, he's got some tucked away from, for the winter, and I am I need some extra. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, there's a part of me that wants to put berries on foraging because it makes sense, but... The lesson you teach? Let me read these prompts. I mean, it's gonna be random, huh? Johnny, we share a lesson mm -hmm. we learn or the foxes. Hmm. I mean, I guess that one still makes the most sense. I'll go there. I'm gonna embrace the randomness a little bit. I'll see what we get. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna roll my d6, and I get a two. Okay, the bounty we share. So, I suppose this does make a great deal of sense. Um. So I'm gonna say that we're we're marching through the mist wood. You know, we're blazing our, our trail through the lush greens and the thickets and the vines. Uh, and all the while, you know, probably to Caspian, what feels like only maybe what a foot in front of his face. There's like a, there's like a, a sheet of, of mist. Uh, but to Solly's expertly trained eye, with all of her time spent in the forest, it's it's easily manageable. Um, and of uh, her favorite berry patch. Uh, she kind of leads us, 
I want to imagine that it's almost like um, there, there's like a large hillside, right? Um, and if you were uninitiated to the ways of the Mistwood, and especially of like the Giants' ways, you know, I imagine um, there are probably like subtle symbols on trees as we're walking that like to a passerby may just look like animal scratchings or like weird patterns in the bark, but to like a giant who, you know, has grown up in the Mistwood and is like inherently sort of bound to nature, um, you know, probably see like these markers and these symbols that mean like, you know, uh, guiding you to certain places or warnings or things of that nature. Um, and I feel like Sully is picking up on those cues and kind of using them to reorient herself because as she said, she's not used to being on the road. So she's kind of using these, um, these old giant, uh, secret symbols to kind of guide her back deeper towards the heart of the wood and where um, her favorite berry patch is. And I imagine we eventually find ourselves at a hillside. Uh, and once again, if you were just a, a common a common folk, uh, it probably wouldn't look like much to you. But Sully expertly sort of leads us around to the side of it. And uh, I imagine there's probably like it looks like maybe an outcropping of like uh, of like stones and rocks that have been like like mossy stones. Like it's covered in like a thick layer of, of, of soft green bedding. Um, but Sully and I don't I don't I'm gonna somewhat give this to you because uh, I imagine that mm -hmm. this this hillside holds a secret, and I imagine that this mossy mm -hmm. stack of stones is the way through. Uh, but I don't want to assume how a giant would find their way through. That's not my business, you know? That's, uh, that's not my expertise. <laughs> uh, but I feel like mm. Sully would know uh, how to enter enter the hillside uh, with her giant magic. And I'm gonna let you take that, that part away. Ooh, okay. Um, so as they're walking to these mossy stones, you know, she's kind of like, oh, that's where I shot my first arrow. And this is where I found my favorite flower. And, oh yeah, over there is where my mom took me the first time I got my lady blood. Um, you know, things like that. Um, but yeah, uh, let's go this way. So she's walking towards the, the mossy stones um, and she goes, okay, wait one second. Um, and I want to say she like takes her staff and uh, there wouldn't, like to the untrained eye, you wouldn't see but her staff is almost like a key in a lock. Um, and she kind of wedges it in this like oddly shaped hole. And it just kind of like, she doesn't even press, she just kind of presses it. And the, the orb on her, her staff just lights up this green and then the rocks just start sliding open. Hell yeah, absolutely. Um... I imagine when, uh, just just to flavor it, because when you say slide, I want to imagine that they they slide, but it, because um, you know, when you think of a secret door, you think of just like opening, right? But I almost imagine that the stones mm -hmm. like part and it's kind of like a spiral out. You know what I mean? Like they're Ooh. sort of like, yeah. leather, you know, that's sort of natural. Yep. It's all spirals and circles, right? Um, and sort of swings out and it opens up. And so we can see into the hillside and it actually, is kind of like this hollowed out dome, right? Which are covered in, I imagine probably like giant carvings and uh, maybe like cave paintings almost. And in the center of the floor, there's just this massive hole. Um, and so in my mind, I'm, I'm gonna insert some giant lore here, uh, Sully, and you can Please. take it or leave it. Uh, in my mind, because you you know you wonder how have the giants been here for so long and they live in the woods and like no one sees them, and it's because they've kind of built this entire subterranean. They're almost like rabbit warrens, you know what I mean? They stretch across the entirety of the Mistwood, but they're sized for people who are like two to three times a normal human. So they're absolutely cavernous, at least to like me. <laughs> maybe maybe not to Vago, but at least to me, um, <laughs> they feel absolutely cavernous. Um, but yeah, it's like filled with all of these like cultural markings and paintings and you know, uh, then it leads to this big hole in the ground, which I imagine will take us into the Warrens. Um, and then in my mind's eye, you know, the Warrens will eventually lead to Sully's favorite bush <laughs> is, is, is in my mind is what's going to happen. 
Um, as we're walking into the caverns and like we see like the cave paintings and stuff like that, she's like, I think some of these were made by my parents when they were little, um, but I did this one. And it's just like a terrible, like a terrible <laughs> rendition of what you could assume might be a fox. Um, but, you know, take it or leave it. Um, That's a really weird and dog. I want to say like... No, no, that is terrible rendition of what might be a fox. Uh, Caspian I turns see. his head almost <laughs> completely sideways. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, that's what I meant. That's, uh, that's, that, that's pretty good. No, no, I'm... it's terrible. <laughs> but it is a rendition of what might be Fox. I was like 50 I was really little. Um, of course. Of course. So you were terrible. If it all makes sense. I would like to think I'm better now. Vago, can you draw? I have never cried. Do you want me to try? And he points yes. at the wall. Celia like finds a very sharp stick, like one that would look like it would make scratches on the wall and kind of hands it to Vago. Vago takes the stick, looks at it for a few minutes, like just sort of turns it over and looks at it this way, looks at it like, all right, okay, yeah. And then he flips it and he starts carving into the wall and he goes pretty quickly. And it, it's pretty apparent about, about halfway through what he's doing that he is exactly copying <laughs> that same fox drawing. <laughs> yeah. And oh, he that's finishes true. it. He finishes it. Just takes a couple, like just a minute, and he holds his his little pointy stick up, and he goes, "Vago is terrible too." <laughs> eh? You know, for how well you copied that, I would say you're incredible. I think right, Caspian. Then that means that you are incredible. He's same fault. Yeah, honestly, you both have left me speechless. Uh, truly, I, I am rendered unable to comment. Uh, the, the artistry on display, uh, it, absolutely. It may surprise you, Caspian, to know that you are speeching. <laughs> <laughs> and making comments. Vago, it's a turn of phrase. I, you know, it's, uh, it's all right. It's fine. We are all learning today. <laughs> <laughs> I think while all of this is happening, uh, and we're watching Vago do a complete carbon copy of the terrible fox, um, there's like a, you know, a subtle flash of, you know, uh, of green and blue in the corner, and when. Um, well, at least Caspian, right, uh, turns his head, controlling myself in the scene. Uh, I turn and I see the the Magus has assumed their their more human form, and the Magus is, you know, even comparatively to us, kind of small. So they they look absolutely tiny in, in this vast space. Um, but you can see that they're sort of walking the perimeter of the dome with like their hand on the walls and sort of taking in these pictures um, and not really speaking to anyone in particular, but more almost like musing to themselves, uh, you know, says something to the effect of, it's been some time since I've, I've witnessed the giant's art firsthand. It's, I'd almost forgotten how, how much beauty and history are, can be in such simple shapes. Your people, Sully, they, they're very good at masking complexity in the mundane and it's good to be reunited with it. It's good to be reunited too. It's been a while since I've seen it myself. And truly, I don't know what a lot of it means, um, but I'm hoping we'll find out when we get to, uh, what's the name of this end place? <laughs> <laughs> what's the Where name of this Where are we going? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Where is our destination? The Umbra? Really, where is our right? destination? Is Umbra? It Umbra, there we go. Yeah. Thank you. When we get to Umbra, <laughs> uh, and to and hearing uh, Sully uh, 
say that she's not quite sure, um, you know, what the pictures mean. Um, the mages, sorry, I forgot who I was for a second, uh, turns, turns their head and, and sort of gives them a, a sort of a, a knowing stare, you know, uh, and says, you mean to tell me that you do not, you do not hear the words right now. They are not speaking to you. You can hear words on the walls. Mm. Yes, it's... Uh, no, go ahead. Uh, and the mage sort of cranes the ear to the side. Yes, they they sing for me. Some of them dance for me as well. I, I had assumed it might do the same for you, but perhaps you've been away for too long. Would you... Would you like me to help you see? Yes, please. Um, and to this, the magus um, <clears throat> nods their head um, very well and sort of adopts a, we'll say a meditative posture, sort of facing the wall. And uh, their eyes, you know, uh, begin to, th there's, like a, there's like a subtle whisper under their breath and it sort of, probably to Solly would probably be the only one who understands it. It's probably like uh, some ancient giant tongue. It's probably even more archaic than the giant speak that like your parents grew up with. It's probably like some sub variation. Probably like you you mm. mentioned um, in the Umbral Lands, right? Where the giants began, but you've never been. It's probably like some dialect mm. of that. So you're understanding like certain words and phrases, but it's not like entire sentences. Uh, but there's definitely sort of a, a calling to something, a um, an invoking of some sort of power, and the their eyes sort of tilt back into their head, and they slightly, you know, pull pull their head backward, and you can see like subtle like twitches happening, like almost uh, involuntary like muscular spasms and twitches as they're like communing with this otherworldly kind of spiritual force. Uh, and as this is all happening, very very slowly, uh, almost like you're watching. Um, almost like a, a flip book, you know, happened like uh, at a very long drawn out pace. Um, some of these paintings, the ones at least that resemble figures like the fox, for example, uh, begin to move and they begin to almost play out scenes. They're almost kind of like on a loop. Like, you know, perhaps we'll see a moment where, you know, you see the giants maybe first hunting in the mistwood and you see them chasing animals, but then once like they catch the animal, um, then the scene kind of like goes back in time and resets to like when it first starts. So you're kind of like watching these moments of history on a loop. Uh, and we'll even say that like the foxes, the two very terrible foxes, uh, like are like playing with one another, like kind of running around in a circle, like the identical foxes. So cute. Um, but yeah, but then some of the ones that are more like symbols, which are just like carvings of like some sort of giant rune, um, those just sort of reverberate with like this deep echoing you know, giant voice, um, which are, are telling um, stories, or at least snippets of stories, snippets of stories that maybe Sully might be able to understand, given that it's, some of it is an older giant d uh, tongue. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that unfolds all around us, like painted all across the dome, just these like paintings moving and swimming around us, like on top of the stone uh, and the symbols like reverberating and releasing like these uh, it's almost like uh, being like in a sound bath, you know, like we feel our whole bodies kind of vibrating with these ancient giant words that are somehow like imparting meaning into us. Mm. Is Sully the only one that can see this or can we all see it? I think we can all, we can definitely all see the pictures moving and mm -hmm. we definitely, I think hear at least the reverberations or the intonations of the giant speak. I know for one, Caspian doesn't know what the hell they're saying. Um, he just mm -hmm. feels it in his chest, right? Feels it in his whole body. Um, but yeah, I think we see the things move, but you know, we obviously don't have the context that Sully has. Mm. Um, I want to say as Sully is looking at these images move and she's like hearing bits and pieces of the ancient giant language that she can't fully understand. I want to say that she's kind of like in this trance state where she doesn't even realize that y'all are all seeing this too. And so she's kind of just like walking around, uh, not really looking at the surrounding, just kind of like trapped in this like image that she's seeing. Um, 
and like at one point she's like she's stuck on an image which looks like a like a giant boat with like giant figures kind of crossing the sea um and she's kind of stuck there for a minute uh and at this point you kind of see like tears start coming from her eyes but she doesn't like make sounds like she's crying and she doesn't feel like she's crying but she's just kind of like tearing up um Caspian is, uh, I mean, truly, I think, rendered speechless in this moment. Maybe just because he's never seen magic. I mean, yes, he's seen magic physically manifested like this, but only, like, within the confines of, like, Ravenhall, like, from the mages, like, in the gardens. Um, it's sort of, like, part um, watching something that he doesn't quite understand unfold, and then also par partially, like, uh, as much as he doesn't understand about giants and giant culture and their history, like, he definitely knows Sully, and, you know, they haven't known each other very long, but has definitely earned, you know, some level of, of respect in him, you know, and so I think there's a part of him who sees her being so affected, and even though he doesn't quite know how to interpret the events that are happening, um, just sort of remains silent and, and um, just experiences this um, as best he can to see if he can even, like, come close, like, to the slightest itch of what uh, Sully might be experiencing in her, like, own internal world. Mm. Um, I want to say, you know, since the Magus is, like, sick and, you know, magic is dying, I want to say, like, projecting this magic into a way that more than one person can see outside of himself. I feel like this is going to be strong magic. Oh, it's, yeah. It's a lot of energy. Absolutely. And I want to say that the magic is getting tired and like the images start flickering and they kind of stop moving and like the 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 sounds that we're hearing are kind of like eh, 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 like when you're like losing connection like on the phone or something like that before it all just kind of flicks back into that still image and the silence that we initially you know walked into. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a moment where, you know, you hear like a, an interruption of breath, like, a, <clears throat> you know, like from the Magus um, as like such an exertion of magical force happens and and perhaps they like even double forward and like put their hands on the wall to like brace them from completely like face planting uh into the stones nearby um and it, you know caspian sort of almost instinctively like takes a step forward um just because that's his charge right that's the whole reason he's here um but the mage just just you know raises a single hand and says no don't worry i'm i'm fine i just i these are old magics, and they are, they are quite strong, and I am, I am not what I used to be. Just, I'll, I'll need some moments of, of, of rest, and I'll be fine. Um, I want to say with that, Sully kind of snaps out of it, uh, when the mages kind of doubles forward, and also instinctively reaches forward for the, for the mages, uh, you know, before he tells us that he just needs a moment. Um... And Sully is like, well, uh, and kind of just like, is at a loss for words. And she's like, oh, wait, uh, berry patch. Let's, let's go to the berry patch. Um, Magus, you'll be, you'll be safe here. The door is closed and there's no giants around here other than me and possibly my parents. So you can rest here if you'd like. Uh, yes, uh, Sully, that, that would suit me fine. Thank you. If you could. If you could remember just a berry. I can do that. <laughs> uh, and you can see the Magus uh, nods and like, um, because, you know, the Magus is this uh, almost like otherworldly entity. Um, they, instead of like, they, they, I don't even think they get up. I think from their cross-legged position, they just straighten their legs out, lay completely flat on their back cross their their arms like over their their chest uh and like and 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 maybe not not even close their eyes maybe just like keep their eyes like wide open but like you can tell there's no movement there there's it's it's almost like a, it's an utter stasis you know just sort of like a trance like state um that is going to allow them to recuperate um but yeah just completely flattens out arms over the chest like leans head back and just disconnects from reality as we know it in fact Straight actually actually since um since i we had established earlier that the magus is proficient in 
um, astronomancy, which was the made-up magical art of mm. reading the stars, um, perhaps like that's what we see happen with the eyes. Maybe there's just like a slight bluish glaze, um, and you can see some constellations that shimmer behind. So kind of like leaving their consciousness, you know, out of their physical body and like going to some other realm, you know, some astral planar, planar connection that is kind of going to reinvigorate them. Um, maybe, and that's kind of how we know that they're sleeping, you know, they just sort of, their eyes, like, star out, and they cross arm in vampire style, and then they're out. I love this. Um, so, like, kind of, like, spares one glance back to the, to the mages, and then kind of, like, motions for, uh, Caspian and Vago to follow. Um. I follow. And I want to say, Sully leads them deeper into this cavern, and... It's kind of like well constructed. Like it looks like they put a lot of thought into this. This isn't just kind of like a thrown together shelter or anything like that. Um, it's actually fairly clean. Um, I want to say there's like little skylights that you see that almost imitate sunlight, but I want to say they're like pools of magic that are kind of like Ooh. providing light to this place. Um, there's yeah. like moss and like natural like like vines and stuff hanging from the ceiling. Um, I want to say on the way to the berry pit, we're kind of coming down what looks like a big spiral staircase. Um, and in the middle, there's just like this running like waterfall um, that comes into this pool at the bottom, um, this giant pool. Uh, and at the, the base of this staircase and on the edge of this pool is a giant berry bushel. <laughs> Oh, this is the bush. <laughs> Gatsby is just trying to... <laughs> His idea of a bush is very different than what he's seeing right now. This is the bush. It's my favorite. No, yeah, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good bush is what it is. <laughs> Do you want to try a berry? Um... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, if, if, if that's all, all right. You know, he sort of looks around. He's not, like, sure, you know, he doesn't want to, like, take anything that's, like, sacred or, you know, he's not quite sure the decorum level of, of a place like this. Um, so I was gonna say, no worries, and goes over to the bush, and I want to say she kind of, like, rests her palm on, like, the base of the bush and goes, I'm gonna take a little bit now, but don't worry, I won't take too much. Um... And like with that, she just starts like picking these little berries off uh, of this bush. I want to say they're like light pink berries. Uh, some that are more ripe are like this darker magenta. Uh, and if they're a little underripe, they've got like this little yellow spotting on it. Um, but they all seem to be in like pristine condition. Uh, and you know, she takes like a handful or so and just kind of just holds them up to Caspian. Uh, Caspian gingerly extends his hand, <laughs> uh, which probably <laughs> looks. You know, quite, quite, uh, I'm imagining the size of a berry for Sully is maybe like the size of like a, like, I don't know, like a, like a clementine for him. Like, it's probably, <laughs> there's like a slight alteration in sort of the size mechanics. Uh, but he gingerly takes one uh, and sort of holds one in her direction and gives like a cheers. And she goes, Vago, you too. Hold, hands one to Vago as well. I want to say that at this point, You've suddenly noticed that Vago has actually not followed along. Oh! Vago's <laughs> lost in the kid the Warrens? What's happening? <laughs> All right. Oh, and I want to say that Sully was so in thought leading you, leading what she thought was y'all on the way here with what she just saw that she didn't notice at all. Until this moment where she's like, Vago, and turns around and has a bear and she's like, Vago? <laughs> Cass. Vago! I, I thought he was behind you! <laughs> How did we lose this guy? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's gonna go, Vago! And kind of shout, and it's gonna go, Vago, Vago! <laughs> <laughs> and then we listen. How far away is the the berry patch from where we left the Archmage? I want to say it's a good walk. Um, maybe, maybe we've been walking for about like five to seven minutes. Uh, then I'm gonna say that you you catch back with just absolutely no like inflection, a, a return echo of solely, 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 solely. Caspian, <laughs> you know where that came from, like direction wise. 
Uh, I mean, only one way to find out, really. Uh, <laughs> sort of, like, takes the, the berry and, like, puts it into, like, his satchel and says, like, I, I guess another time. Uh, thank you, Sully. <laughs> Ada, Ada looks towards the bush and he's like, thank you, bush. Um, it's seeing that, like, Sully had spoken to it before and not, not quite sure if it's, like, entirely sentient. Uh, I appreciate you. Uh, this looks delicious. Can't wait. Can't wait to try it. Um, and he's gonna, like, slowly, like, not, like, he's not gonna turn his back on the bush just in case. He's gonna back his way out towards the <laughs> exit of the little, like, hovel. And then once he's, like, cleared it, he'll turn around and, like, go into the direction of where, uh, Vago's voice was coming from. Uh, I want to say Sully kind of lingered back as Caspian left, and as soon as Caspian kind of turned, the bush kind of, like, moves slightly. Of course it um, does. Of course it does. Uh, <laughs> and then she kind of smiles at the bush and goes, see you later, and then walks after Caspian with her handful of clementine berries. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm heading towards Vago. What do I find? <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that uh, just to be sure on the way back, you play a little game of Marco Polo. Right. <laughs> yeah. Vago, 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 Foley, Foley, Foley. Foley. <laughs> and then a Caspian, Caspian, Caspian. Um, which leads you right back to the Archmage, mm. um, lying prone on the ground, still stars in his eyes, still recovering. Uh, Vago standing, sort of statuesque, a sentry over him, but there are a few more figures now in this little clearing. One of them is a rather withered-looking humanoid lying on the ground, frozen in a total rictus, black-robed, pale skin, um, just absolutely incapacitated and, like, locked in fear on the ground and then standing sort of obediently next to Vago are three uh, not quite so alive wolves <laughs> just just like they were alive them. at one point and then were made they're, but they they're were animated very clearly yes they are reanimated okay okay they, they weren't Forest alive and creatures. Vago made them dead. They were alive and dead, but then alive and now re-dead. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. Well, <laughs> yes. Uh, yes and no. Yes. Uh, but Vago sees you both approach and says again, Caspian, slowly, made new enemy, took new enemies, made new friends. Friends. New friends? Are these... Well, enemy made new enemies. I simply made enemies friends. <laughs> friend dogs. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I'm gonna... <laughs> Caspian's gonna look down at the reanimated wolves. Are they, like... Are they animate? Are they... Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. They're still very much, like, up on, all, up on their paws and bile dripping from their jaws or whatever it is that undead wolves do. You, uh, you adopted the dead dogs? <laughs> yeah, I say, like, just, like, I don't know how else to, like... <laughs> I thought could could do the same as with him and he gestures to the the clearly, like, not sure if he's dead, necromancer on the ground, but, uh, could do like with him, or could make more friends. <laughs> I mean, I like friends, but these guys are kind of creepy. No? You. Lago, do you don't creep you out? <laughs> you know, like? I mean, I like new friends. I've never seen dogs like this before. I'm gonna, uh, Caspian is gonna slowly, like, no, no matter how well behaved the wolves look, he's gonna make a semi-circle around them, like, one hand on the hilt of his sword, 
in the direction of the of the robe, the dark robe figure. Uh, Loki says, "Frenemies, yeah, pretty much, <laughs> yeah." So I think we've established we have some frenemies. Um, I like sidestep my way to the um, to the dark robe figure. I also kind of look to the Magus and Vago as I'm like leaning down towards the dark robe figure, and I say, "The Magus, they're uh, they're all right." The Magus is resting. Vago defend. Vago do good. Yeah, uh, yeah, Vago did good. Uh, how did they get inside? I mean, Sully had the opening. Yeah. How did... Did you see? Vago just shrugs. You know, that's a good point. I've never seen anyone in here except for me and my parents. And we've definitely hidden in here. I've never seen someone that wasn't a giant be here. Uh, I cut Maybe. a very concerned glance to Sully at that. Maybe he Sully is also. He stick? Uh, Sully. He shouldn't have a stick. I, um, I don't know much about giants, so, you know, please correct mm. me if I'm wrong. Um, do you bury your dead? We do bury our dead. We we normally bury our dead in empty fields, and we gift our body to the soil and become trees. Okay, so you don't have maybe like a big room down here that's full of like giant bones or anything oh, like no, that. Oh no, elephants. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't I didn't mean to offend. I I don't know. <laughs> You know, I'm just seeing what I'm seeing. I'm sorry. No, no, sorry. no offense taken. No offense taken. Um, no. And she kind of like looks over at the necromancer, and you can kind of see the color like slightly drain from her face because she just does not understand how these people are here. Uh, at that point, I'm going to mm -hmm. shing, uh, draw my blade, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to hold it and sort of like. It's like a defensive posture, uh, you know, sort of like a blade first, like sort of guard once again, implying some training. Um, and I'm gonna put my hand on the the robed figure's shoulder, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna try to turn them over and just see if I can get them. I, I, I assume they were face first on the ground, so I'm just gonna go with that. I'm gonna try to flip them over on their back to see, you know, if they're not only really dead, they're really most sincerely dead. Uh, and keeping the blade, you know, primed just in case. As you flip them over, the body is uh, in a total, like, rigor mortis. Mm -hmm. As if it has been dead for quite a while. Um, the skin beneath the robes feels cold. But when you, when you flip them over to see their face, it's not that there's any, like, color in their cheeks, but there's just something in their eyes that makes it seem like they're kind of, they're kind of dead, but they're kind of alive still. Um, and you're not really sure, maybe, if that's because of Vago or because of the kind of dark shit that they do, hmm. clearly, on the regular. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, like... I'm very unsettled, <laughs> first of all. Let me just say that. <laughs> Chiefly, I'm very unsettled. Uh, and you, you probably hear, like, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> under, like, like Caspian's <laughs> breath. Uh, I'm gonna, like, keep my sword um, almost, like, rested against the shoulder, just in case I have to make, like, a quick chop down towards the neck. Uh, but I am gonna, like, run my hand sort of, like, down the front of the robe and try to feel for, like, you know, maybe, like, a satchel or... You know, something on there. Actually, I mean, I'm a thief. I'm a master thief. Some might, some oh, might say. Oh. Um, so I'm probably very familiar with this. Um, uh, what, 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 uh, what's the likelihood that I, I find something uh, cool on this on this necromancer, uh, Garrett? Since since you installed them into the story, why don't you just roll uh, all of your thief dice, and mm -hmm. however many evens you get, that's how many cool things you find. Ooh, I like Ooh. the way you think. Okay, so we'll uh, let's roll some my very cool thief dice, as you put it. <laughs> um, two two successes. All right. Uh, why don't we each take one, me and Amber? Okay. Okay. 
Uh, I'm gonna say, actually, if you think of something first, you hop in. Um, yeah, uh, I want to say you find like a component pouch, um, and in that component pouch, I want to say, you know, you find like items that necromancers would draw their power from, um, and I want to say what's in there is kind of like calcified bones and maybe like a vial of blood. Um, you find like a really nice, like very sharp, like small knife. Um, and then a really odd looking, like jet black, almost like it's like cut like a diamond, but it's completely black. Mm. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to say that you find, um, part of a staff, very, um, roughly like snapped, uh, the head of it basically being the same as Sully's. Similar, not exactly the same, but having that same sort of uh, a vibe as the one that opened up the hillside in the first place. All right. Uh, I know that I'm, I am already saying this out loud. I am going to regret this. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but being the person that Caspian is and has historically been, um, he, you know, expertly, he knows exactly what to do to, to find a hidden component pouch with a, a hidden, uh, purse with his hands. He just, like, snaps right in there, finds it, flips it open, uh, immediately, with almost no hesitation, pockets the spooky black diamond. Just 100%, he sees a shiny rock that looks like it, he could pawn it, uh, he puts that in his pocket, uh, and I'm sure that will be bad later, but not now. And so, uh, and you know, he, he sort of like rifles through the blood and the bones, and it's like, oh, like there's no, no, no interest in that. Uh, but then he sees the splintered staff, um, and you know, the I was gonna say the light bulb, but the uh, <laughs> the will o' wisp alights above <laughs> Caspian's head uh, as he's starting to connect the dots, uh, and he turns around and he says, "Sully, I." I think I know how they got in. And I, I extend my hand out toward her and I and I show her the, the shattered piece of the, the giant staff. Um, she's looking at the staff and like as she's reaching for it, she kind of like stops and pauses and goes, is there a rune on the side facing you? It should be shaped almost like a spiral. I'm going to assume for storytelling purposes that the, the, the right answer is there is one, yes? <laughs> to, to get inside, would they need to get inside? Mm, I mean, could be, could be. Could be? I'm gonna let you take it. <laughs> I have answers for both. I have answers for both. Yeah, you have, okay, I love that. I, I, I love that you had an answer for both. Uh, so then, uh, yeah, Caspian will turn it over uh, in his hands and inspect it a little bit closer. And he'll say, I mean, uh, and because we kind of described earlier how the giants, their runes sometimes are invisible to the layman, right? Because they don't they don't write in the language of nature like people do. Uh, but he does mm -hmm. see like a weird warp in the wood. You know, maybe it's a, a strange nodding in it. But the more he looks at it, the more it seems, you know, a bit more purposeful. Uh, and he says, mm -hmm. I, I think so. And he like, he, he shifts it around to like face you. Talking about this? And she kind of like grabs it from at this point and goes, there's no way they should know about this unless they found my parents. <laughs> oh, rubbing the hands <laughs> together. Okay. <laughs> okay. And if her color was gone from her face now, it's completely gone. She's just pale. Uh, and that hits Caspian like a ton of bricks. And he says, your parents, they're, they're still in the mistwood. They're around here. They should be. When I left, they were here. Uh, do you know, uh, you know, where they would be f from here? I know exactly where they would be. I, I look to Vago <laughs> and his newly found <laughs> litter of undead puppies, which he's, he's just made. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know, Vago, I mean, um... Far be it for me to pull us astray from the path here with the magus, but if Sully's family is in danger, we can do something about it. 
Uh, Vago looks down at the Archmage, mm. who uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you, mm. uh, Mm-hmm. Are they still uh, astronomancing <laughs> their uh, self back to health? Um, I think at this point, the almost as if prophetically, right, <laughs> right on time, uh, <laughs> the the stars in the eyes, uh, you know, fade out, and the arch, uh, the major just like sits up and like <laughs> with the hand still across the chest, and then like drops them uh, to their sides, like almost with it without Vago needing to say anything. Just like holds up a hand and says, "I'm awake," <laughs> and like it's like sort of, <laughs> sort of is like is of is at least partially aware of, of of what is happening. Uh, Vago looks down to the Archmage and back up to Caspian and Sully and says, "Where Archmage go, Vago go." Um, the Archmage. Uh... I keep saying Archmage, Magus, whatever. That's essentially what they are. They're the most powerful, magical person. Uh, The Magus uh, tilts their head over to Sully. And there is, once again, there's a a, a look of deep knowing, but not one of of much intention or knowledge, right? It's just sort of like this piercing, Mm. you know, this sort of like soulful stare. Uh, And simply says... simply says you need to see what has happened do you know what has happened it does not matter if I know that knowledge does not help nor hinder me you are the one who needs to see and you are the one who needs to know well let's go then and uh, the mage just looks back to Vago. Then we go. We go. <laughs> uh, Vago reaches out a hand, which just quietly seems to make sense to the Magus, who transforms once more into a, uh, an owl and alights on Vago's forearm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think I think uh, I think we got we got places to be. It sounds like yeah. <laughs> we um, we I would hate some to put a, right there. Well, we did. Um, can I'd hate to put a pause here, but I have to run to the bathroom real quick. Oh no, that's Do fine. <laughs> uh. All right, if that's the case, everyone, uh, thank you so far for sticking around and chat. We got some people who are watching. We appreciate your time and your energy. Uh, how are you having a good time? I didn't expect to run into necromancers. Uh, not not me. And if those are too scary, just take a moment. To, oh my goodness, we have a visitor. We have a visitor. <laughs> the, what? A kitty cat has replaced Amber. Oh, I, <laughs> for some reason <laughs> I don't I don't see that. On, oh, now I see it. Oh, <laughs> baby, sweet little Aww. baby. Oh, I ran away. Ran away. Um, but if the necromancer is too scary for anyone, just just take a moment to picture the mage just as an owl. Just nibbling on that big old pink berry. <laughs> yeah, that will bring you. That will bring you right back. back. To your uh, I I have to know: are the are the undead wolves following? <laughs> are are they following Vago? Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Just so we, just we so have three undead wolves now. Three. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. <laughs> But yes, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining for our uh, our spooky misadventure. Wow, I uh, this this, I mean, this just goes to show the nature of uh, improvisational storycraft. Uh, there's nothing on at least th- that I know of. There's nothing on this piece of paper that says necromancers. <laughs> yeah, but we we found it. Uh, that was all. That was all that was, when I asked about what the dangers of the mistwood were. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, you know, that's pretty cool. Dark mages. You say it, they're showing up. They're showing up. Uh, oh, okay. Make sure my stream isn't going nuts. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. Uh, I think we have Amber joining us again. Yeah, I see you right there. I am yeah. Can you all hear right. me? Oh, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So then Amazing. I think Amber, I'm going to say my scene. I mean, we kind of did a bunch of things there. Looking at the prompts, we, uh, we learned a lesson. We shared a bounty. And, and there were foxes. We kind of did all three. <laughs> Unintentionally. Yeah, we did. 
Uh, so uh, that was my scene. So I believe you're the last in the the uh, the scene order. So you get to pick the next one. Cool. I think following along with our timeline, I think my moonlight is our oh baby. Oh, <laughs> Jack. That's that's the necromancy dogs. Yeah, the exactly. <laughs> They're following the effort. <laughs> Um, hold on, wait. Uh, should I wait till Garrett comes back? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, every, every, this is da 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 It's funny, like my I have the stream deck open on my computer, but I guess mm. or my laptop, but it, it's oh. not it's not caught up all the way. But oh, oh Jack, your baby. oh Jack. <laughs> That. If he barks during the stream, he has to come say hi. Oh, <laughs> what a what a he gift! It, as you can see. What an unexpected look gift! I know. Look at that. Look at that boy. <laughs> oh, He's so mad. Jack, I have not seen you in real life in so long. I need to come, come give on, that. Bella. I have to give that boy a pet on the head. It'll be cool. Oh, okay. Anyway, where are we going? Uh, that's uh, a great question. We are going. Amber's about to lead us there. Wherever yeah. we're going. We are going by moonlight, which I think makes a ton of sense. We're about to travel Ooh. by moonlight. It is nighttime, uh, and the prompt is a memory of home. Oh, I moved. I, moved. Oh, I, go. I gotta move me. Uh, oh, actually, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know who's being invited yet, so I shouldn't move anybody. Oh, everybody's invited. Everybody's invited, okay. Yeah, I forgot that that was a piece of this. Oh. Solly's still hanging out at the barley, man. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no. so Solly's partying up with the Barley Lord over there. Solly was never here. It was a figment of y'all's imagination. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, I want to say Sully is almost, I don't want to say sprinting because she knows that y'all have to file, but she is moving very fast these four. It's like she knows them. Uh, she knows what's around the corner. She knows which, which left to take. She knows which tree to avoid. Like, um, and she's just kind of going. She's not really looking back at y'all. Um, I want to say on the way, like we're really just in the thick of a forest right now. So it's very tight. Uh, eyesight or uh, eye line is really difficult. Um, and we sometimes see the, the moonlight shining through the trees, but it is kind of rare at this point um, with how thick the foliage is. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, about to say, I imagine every one of Sully's steps is like two and a half of mine. So I am, I am hoofing it as hard as I can, uh, to try and keep up with Sully's, uh, very, uh, understandably empowered steps as, uh, as she rushes back towards, uh, where, whatever, wherever we're being led to. Um, good. Vado's trudging along behind, uh, the mage's owl on his shoulder now, and the three undead wolves just trotting along behind him. Not out of breath, not breathing at all, just <laughs> adding along like macabre little semi-rotten canines. Mm. Um, I want to say, at this point, there's a, there's a really big lake. Um like a clearing that opens up to like a really really big lake and slowly kind of stops uh right after the tree line and kind of like inspects the area uh and she she looks at both of y'all um and the magus and goes someone who isn't my parents has definitely been here because the door is open and she kind of gestures into the lake and you can see like that there is almost like an air bubble that's coming, protruding out from like the depths of the lake. Um, and the water's just kind of flowing around it. Like it's not even going into the cavern at all. Um, normally you wouldn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not something I would expect to see. You are correct in, in that assumption. <laughs> um. Vago, I think, is not going to hesitate. He's going to um, hoist his shoulder up a little bit. The mages is going to flap up, fly off, and actually go back and settle on Caspian's shoulder. Um, 
with to how how does Caspian react to that? <laughs> I, th- I think it's it's like surprise at first, like there's just sort of because like, he's not used to animals being near him in general. So there's like he sees like a flap of oh oh okay oh, all right uh, and just like realizes it's the magus and then kind of like settles into it. I think he's like probably holding his one shoulder at like an awkward angle because he's not quite sure if like that's what he should be doing. Uh, all right, well hey, as long as you're comfortable, right? Okay, thanks. And while Caspian settles into that new experience, um, <laughs> Vago is just sort of like going forward on the warpath toward the door. The wolves are trotting behind and without any sort of like having to command it, they're sort of growling to themselves. <laughs> this is beautiful. Um, Selly's gonna like run after Vago as well, and uh, she's gonna kind of find another one of those like keyholes at the edge of the lake and place her staff there again. And the water's just kind of sh- gonna shift like it's a wall. And it reveals like a staircase that comes down into that air bubble. Like a giant sized staircase though. <laughs> Hell yeah. Like 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 the sides of the staircase, like the water like pouring in. That's what I'm like mm-hmm. imagining. Yeah, mm-hmm. very mm-hmm. cool. Very cool. I mean, that's what I see in my mind's eye. <laughs> I love uh, this. Um, go ahead. Uh, Vago's running, you're opening the thing, uh, I, I, I have no context, <laughs> so, but, so, <laughs> but it seems like everyone is, uh, you know, I'm just gonna pull out my sword, shing, you know, <laughs> like, maybe, like, <laughs> put it, like, in front of my face, and maybe, like, whisper, uh, some sort of, uh, what's the word, um, uh, not so much a prayer, I don't think that Caspian's a very religious person, but perhaps maybe, you know, like a, like an oath, you know, something that he might have sworn in, in his past uh, to himself that, you know, before like a battle that would bring him some level of like solace or like a steel head. Uh, and then after he's done, uh, he just sort of like shrugs, you know, like <laughs> rustles up his shoulders. And Knight's not getting any younger. And he starts like marching towards the, towards the <laughs> staircase with his sword in hand. Um, uh, amazing. I think. Good. So, uh, Vago is just making a beeline down those stairs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think by the time he hits the cavern entrance, he just says right out, Hello! If you are not Sully's mother and father, reveal yourself. And the, the uh, wolves behind him start growling and, like, barking and barking. Ooh. Uh, Sully's gonna get also to that opening and kind of wait and she's kind of looking around and I think from what she can see like inside the cavern there's definitely signs of a struggle things are broken kind of messy in there um, and I want to say at Vago's shout I want to say a group of necromancers kind of make themselves known uh, and behind them we see this giant like decomposing bear and it just growls. <laughs> uh, and I want to say nice. there's about four or five. Four? Five? Let's say five. Give us a challenge. Five necromancers. Uh, inside. Nice. It's never just something I can chop easy, is it? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like gripping the edge of my sword. Uh, okay. So it sounds like we're about to head into a fight, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so this is where we kind of have to come to a consensus as a group what the, the challenge rating of this combat will be. So there's, uh, easy, which is one die, which I'm assuming it's not easy. Uh, tricky, which is two. Hard, which is three. Heroic, which is four. Legendary, which is five. Or impossible, which is six and over. Um. My gut is heroic. Four dice. My gut is also heroic. All right. Four dice it is. And I'm gonna cue up (sighs) some battle music. (laughs) Yes, and this is Reese's for following, right? Yes. Let me open this up. Um. Okay. So then, let me go to. I have my rules up as well. All right. So, so first things first. Uh, I guess we should establish uh, who's gonna go first, us or them. Um, so who's the first? Garrett, you're normally the first in our storytelling order. Uh, so why mm-hmm. don't you give me? Um, you know, uh, 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 a trope or a cliche and a, you know, a, a possible starting action and we'll roll to see who is getting the first move here. 
Uh, starting action for for Vondo? Uh, yeah. I'm gonna go uh, Defender. He's gonna brace for whatever wave of necromantic energy they're about to unleash and absorb it in front of you guys. Okay, and uh, what is your role for your Defender there? Uh, oh boy. Uh, that's two out of four. Two out of four? One out of four. Okay. Uh, yes. So uh, the <laughs> necromancers, uh, they see you approach. Uh, I, I, I guess we're all going to share narration of this of this combat. Uh, so feel free oh, to, yeah. Uh, yeah. to steal anything if you need. Yeah. Uh, but I imagine, you know, they, they see us approach. Uh, and there's, like, not even, like, a, a word. Like, they, they're, they're almost deadly silent. You know, all you can see are their hoods and maybe, like, that the gleam of those, like, dead shark-like eyes behind the shadows of, of their hoods. As they like turn around towards us, and you can hear maybe some uh, some deep somber like uh, uh, chanting in an ancient tongue, like Surosia Miatu, and like they make this like almost uh, synchronized hand motion where it's creating those same. Um, you you narrate uh, Vago's magic like a dark purple, right, Garrett? Yeah. Yeah. So I imagine they create like these like these wispy, shadowy like um, like. Uh, almost inky uh, strands of, of purple energy into like this weird circle shape and then they swoop, 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 like they each like put their hand forward as it streaks towards uh, the party and Vago of course hunkers down and you said you absorb it so I'll let you narrate how that happens uh, the, the, the wave of purple energy hits him and every single rune on his body that you've seen through the various spells that he cast through the visions of his past um, flares up with that same color, grows very brightly and intensely as that wave just sort of like, it's still like just crashing into him, giving off billows of purple energy, and then it wanes and wanes and wanes. Uh, the runes glow bright and then go out as it just disappears. Uh, and to this, all of the necromancers like stand shocked for a moment as they look back and forth to each other. Uh, and, and you, once again, we can't read their, their expressions because they're, they're sort of stoically hidden behind their hoods, but now realizing that perhaps their magics are not as strong as they once thought, uh, they all, once again, in sort of a, a creepy synchronicity, each take, like, one step back and then simply raise their hands and, and point towards the party as that massive bear just shambles in between the two of them, like, on either rows and just lets out, like, a guttural, begins, like, clawing in our direction. Um, so yes, uh, that was Garrett, right? Yep. Okay. And that means that was one success. So they lose a dice in that contest. Um, so it's going to be me. So that means they have three dice left? Correct. Um, okay. and, uh, let's see here. So now Caspian, uh, is going to see... Oh gosh, what what do I have? I'm a con artist. That isn't gonna help me here. Uh, thief, <laughs> thief isn't gonna help me here as as, as far as I know. Uh, maybe fortune teller, maybe knight. Uh, but knight's actually my weakest trope. Um, okay, uh, Caspian is going to hold his sword outward. Uh, obviously, he does not want to cross blades with the bear. Uh, that's probably a bad idea. Uh, and so. He's going to, he's going to, he blinks like real hard and there's a flash of light behind his eyes and you can see like the astronomancy constellations slowly beginning to churn uh, around in his mind uh, as he sees the bear barreling down toward, I imagine, uh, I imagine Vago, right? Because that's, that's, the necromancers would have pointed Vago to, to stop Vago from absorbing all the magic. Uh, and there's like a, there's a part of Caspian who's trying to foresee events. He's trying to see maybe where the bear will be before it goes there so that he can warn Vago just in time before he catches some claws. Uh, so I will roll Fortune Teller, which is three. Mm. Which is no successes. <laughs> uh, versus the them which are two successes. Okay, so um, I'm holding my blade out um, and I'm seeing all the different projections of possible future events. I can see almost like wisps 
of the bear's body and Vago's body uh, getting closer towards one another. And I think I foresee a future where, you know, Vago's about to be struck. And so, like, I sort of flash back out into consciousness and I yell, Vago! But as soon as I yell that, I, like, interrupt the pattern of time. The bear just Ooh. wheels around, like, instinctively hearing me and drags those rotting claws, like, against my chest. Uh, and you just, Ooh. you just hear the leather and the, and the cloth give way. There's a splatter of red blood against the, the stones. Uh, and there's sort of like a dark, um, what's the word? Like, uh, a dark, uh, uh, communal chuckle, like a, <laughs> that echo from like the necromancers nearby. Uh, so I lose a dice. I'm down a dice. That was a loss for me. Uh, so Amber, that's going to be you. So just to clarify, when we lose a dice, we lose it from one of our cliches. Correct. And if any of your dice, any cliche, hit zero, you are incapacitated. Got it. Okay, cool. And what we're rolling for is evens, right? Correct. Uh, and sixes and we... explode. Yep. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, cool. In a good way, right? Yeah, yeah yes. You can roll way. again, and hopefully okay, cool, it'll cool. give you another thing. All right, cool. Um... Seeing Caspian just get like raked by these bears' claws, Sully's just gonna let out this like guttural like growl almost, and she's gonna go wrestle this bear. Um, <laughs> so she's gonna literally charge the bear and just grab it and try to pin it down. So she's trying to take down this bear. All right. Um, which is my strongest feat of strong arms. Uh, all right. Let's see, forty-six, right? Mm-hmm. Come on, don't fail me now. Wait, roll. Oh my god, that is one success. <laughs> uh, ah! Yeah, that's gonna be that's gonna be a failure. Uh, so Sully, you <laughs> run up uh, to the bear. You, uh, well, you, you tell me how you wrestled this bear. I or mean, I was to wrestle this bear. To, I wanted to kind of run up on the bear. And kind of like, I want to put my weight down on my thighs and I kind of wanted to grab it below its arms. I'm trying to like do a, like a slam, but you know. Well, what, what I'll say is uh, yeah. you you get in there. So you're essentially you're bear hugging the bear. <laughs> you're giving this bear a bear yeah. hug. Uh, <laughs> and, and sounds like trying to like suplex it. Uh, and you and you get like the surprise on it and you begin to hoist it. Uh, but in so doing, like as you're grabbing it, uh, the necromancers just raise their arms and there's like another uh, streak of <laughs> Uh, purple light that erupts out from their hands as they begin pinging your back and you can see um, every blast against your flesh uh, sort of like makes it grow pale and like leathery and like a little um, uh, wrinkled mm. and, and it's it's not like, it's almost like you're feeling a flesh wound but like deeper within your flesh. Like it's not hurting the surface like going deeper into like a more vital mm. part of your essence. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, uh, that allows the bear to just break your grip as you're being hailed and buffeted by all the necromantic blasts. I think that's uh, back to Garrett. <laughs> yep. Uh, I'm gonna use my dark mage ability now. Ooh. Trope, trope archetype. Um, and I'll tell you what it does. <laughs> tell, yeah, roll. you tell me what it does. Cause I got plans if it works. Oh God, oh no. Get her. Get rolled into my closet. Hold on, I got one victory, but <laughs> I thought shit meant we definitely lost him. Oh, that's another one. That's two, two victories. Uh, two to one. That's a success. Let's um, go. So the bear gets past Vago to attack Caspian, um, and it, the bear is now wrestling with Sully, though it's not going so well for her. Uh, Vago reaches out and grasps at like the thin air behind the nape of the, br of the bear's neck and he grabs something and as soon as he does that there's like a tendril of purple energy leading from the bear to the necromancers to one of them and he takes that and he just rips it Ooh. breaks it and this like feedback of that necromantic energy travels back along this whipping magical tendril slams into one of the necromancers and that one hits the ground in that exact same pale withered rictus Ooh. form that you found the other necromancer in very sick very that sick. Is so cool <laughs> <laughs> 
Ooh, all right, that that brings it back to me. Uh, okay, when when Vago severs the connection, um, does it seem like that that magical thread is bound to just the the caster itself, or any particular you know focus or anything like that? That may influence uh, what I do. Let's say it, it's like tethered to, to like their chest, like to the center of their life energy. Okay. All right. Uh, oh yeah, but boy. it's like it, it would seem like maybe there's one for each necromancer, but you just can't see them necessarily. Mm. Oh boy! Oh boy! Uh, <laughs> this poor Caspian, he's like, he's like <laughs> kind of a coward at heart. I <laughs> mean, he's really trying. Uh, okay, so uh, Caspian is currently bleeding profusely from his chest, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, sees that Vago severs the connection to one of the necromancers. Throws it against the wall. Uh, I think, and um, Sully, when you're wrestling the bear, uh, do you think the bear fully... Well, actually, I guess from Vago's perspective, when you s uh, sever that connection to the, the necromancer, does anything happen to the bear? I, I think it definitely, like, slows down a little bit. The aggression sort of ebbs. Not enough that, like... The bear has been defeated, but right. clearly it's it's not quite as charged and aggressive. Okay, uh, so I think Caspian sees that uh, and and he sees the confusion and sort of the the dazed nature of the bear after the the magic has sort of been severed uh, and is going to take that opportunity to try his best to capitalize. Uh, he you know uh, braces the blade on his shoulder. Um, rushes forward, there's like a trail of blood underneath him, and he's just gonna try to sink and plant that blade directly into the bear's neck from the side while it's distracted, and like, we'll see what happens. Uh, so this is Caspian. He's only got two for this. Okay, one success. Uh, you know, uh, maybe that'll go somewhere. It will not. It will not go somewhere. Um... <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, Caspian, he's really trying. Oh, no. Um okay, so um Caspian rushes towards the bear. Um we'll say we'll say that like he manages to plant the blade into the bear's neck, uh, and on any other sort of mortal animal, this would probably be a lethal blow, but unfortunately for us, this thing has been already reanimated by dark forces. So like, I plant the blade through the neck, you see it pop out of the other side and there's like a spurt of like black ooze and like fur that comes out of the other side. And there's like a moment of, of like pride and relief that washes over Caspian's face. Uh, but the bear just like wheels around and Caspian's like still holding onto the sword and it pretty much like <laughs> picks him off of his feet and like nearly spins him around. Um, and uh, actually we'll say for narrative purposes, why not? Um, like swings him around and he actually lets go of his sword, right? So the sword is like still lodged into the, the neck mm. of the bear. Uh, and so I go tumbling onto my, my back and like before I have a chance to understand what's happening, there is a robed figure which descends down upon me. Uh, and all I can see, like I just catch it in the nick of time, like I have a flash of insight from my precognition. Uh, but I look up and I see one of the robed figures with one of those those curved knives that you described earlier, uh, Amber, uh, trying to like plunge it down on me. And I just grab their wrists and now we're like sort of wrestling each other on the ground. We're sort of stuck in places. I'm trying to prevent it from planting that thing dead center on me. Uh, that's my turn. Shit. <laughs> Fuck. Um, okay. The whole that time, of course, me. there's, like, some creepy, like, chanting going on, like, <laughs> like, trying to, like, claim my soul with that dagger. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm still wrestling with the bear, no? Uh, let's see. So, Sully's wrestling with the bear, and I feel like at the corner of the eye, she, like, I mean, you tried to grab the bear, so she sees you get flung. Uh, from the bear, she's still wrestling it. I think, <clears throat> I think Sully's gonna plant her feet and try to bring this bear down one more time since she's still in the uh, in the folds of it. Let's see. I feel like this is a bad decision, but it's fine. Um, two successes. Two successes. Uh, that is a success for sure. <laughs> Beautiful. 
Um, yeah, so I want to say after seeing Caspian kind of like flung and his sword still hanging out the bear, I want to say she kind of like uses the sword as leverage, gets up underneath one of the bear's legs and kind of suplexes it over her shoulder, <laughs> rips the sword out of uh, <laughs> out of the bear's neck and kind of tosses it towards Caspian. Oh, hell yeah. He can't grab it yet. But kind of like tosses it towards Caspian uh, with her like elbow still on the bear's neck. Um, so she's kind of like pinning it right now. Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, I, I'm totally cool with saying that the bear gets erased from that equation, and now all we have to say, do, deal with is necromancers, because uh, it sounds like you might have been able to behead that thing with that with that attack. <laughs> I'm here for that. Oh, that'd be cool. Like when I ripped the sword from his neck, I kind of like took its head off. Exactly. That would be kind of cool. Okay, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so there is just a a guttural moan of like uh, the last. The, the last undying breath of this bear uh, as as Sully manages to wrench it clean from its shoulders. Uh, you throw the sword in Caspian's direction, and uh, of course, uh, you, you did get it near him, but you also were dealing with something else entirely. So it, like, hits the, the stones, and it scatters near me, and of course, in classic, you know, cinematic style, like, it's right on my fingertips. Like, I'm reaching for it, and my gloves are, like, just... <laughs> pressing against the handle but i can't quite get my full hand around it while the other one is like wrestling the the dagger in midair uh and that is mm. going to be garrett how many dice are they down to now they're down to one that's what i thought <laughs> i still have five for dark mage so uh again i know what i'm gonna do but i want to see the the numbers first uh that's three successes Oh, I, I somehow I accidentally Ouch. wrote 26 of them, which was not what I meant to do. Uh, <laughs> no, <yeah>. please. <laughs> that is going to be a success for you, absolutely. Uh, and we said there's four necromancers. There were four necromancers, right? There were four, and then you I, uh, severed one, whatever that means. Yeah. yeah. Great. So the um, the wolves, this, pretty much this whole time, have just been standing and like barking at this fight that's going on because they really haven't gotten another command since then. But seeing the bear go down, um, and while the the little tendrils of energy snap back and and uh, distract the remaining necromancers, Vago makes a signal to the dogs, and they all charge forward. Vago and all three. Three of them go for the necromancers. Uh, they pile on to two. So two of them are on the, the toothy end of one and one's on the toothy end of another. Um, and there is just an indescribable carnage of like not quite bleeding flesh being separated from where it should be. Yes. Vago grabs the last necromancer by the neck. Like plants him against the stone wall and you see a flood of purple energy just streaming from the necromancer into Vago as he sucks every last ounce Ooh. of magic from his body. This was Seven the one that ten. was on me? <laughs> Whatever, sure. sure. Uh, I, I just, I just want to make sure, because if you don't kill him, I certainly will. <laughs> 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 Narratively speaking. Well, this is, well, I'm just going to say for now, you, you're, you still have that option. Okay. Um, but Vago has him pinned by the neck up against the stone. He has sapped every ounce of magic from his body. His companions are all bloody or incapacitated on the ground. And Vago just says, My friends have questions. You will answer them. Ooh, I see. I see. I see. I see. I see. Um... Per uh, perfect, perfect time for the music to to uh, transition out of combat mode too. Uh, excellent. Uh, okay, so with Vago uh, exsanguinating the 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 necromatic energy uh, out of this last uh, uh, dark caster, I think you know as much as as much as Caspian would have loved to plant the sword in that necromancer, I think. Um, you know, that it would essentially just be gilding the lily at this point. He'd be exerting energy that he quite honestly needs to make sure that he doesn't bleed out all over the place. Um, and uh, I, so I think there's a part of him that uh, it begrudgingly, you know, wishes he could he could, uh, he could could finish the job, but knows it's, 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 it's really just his pride speaking. And that's gotten him into more trouble than it's worth in the past. 
Uh, so he finally, like, reaches over, grabs the sword, which is finally within reach, uh, sheathes it, and then sort of, um, leans over, and I think he kind of presses himself up against maybe the wall of one of the cave, uh, surfaces nearby, and, and honestly, maybe just starts tending to his wounds. Like, he has questions, but there's, like, other things that need to be taken care of right now. Mm. Um, Sully's gonna kind of get up from that crouch she was in with the bear, uh, and she's going to, like, slowly, like, walk up to the wall and sit next, stand, like, probably, like, right behind Valgo, like, right over his shoulder. And I want to say this is the most menacing you've ever seen, the most jolly Sully look. Like, she's covered in, like, that black blood. Um, and her clothes are kind of ripped and tattered, and she just has no ounce of, like, happiness or joy on her face. Um, and she looks at the necromancer and goes, The two giants that live here. Where are they? And I think I'm gonna give it to you, Wolf, to, to play the guy. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no, why did you saddle me with this? Okay. Because Vago has him up against the wall and Caspian's just kinda chilling right now. So. Yeah, no, you're right. No, it makes sense. I, <laughs> I just wish it wasn't me. Okay, all right, uh, okay. Um, and so you ask, um, where are, uh, the people who, who live here? Mm -hmm. Is that what you ask? Um. Yep. Uh, the necromancer, uh, Vago, are you still holding, uh, holding them up against the wall? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think there's, like, a moment where, you know, maybe, maybe the necromancer tries to struggle against the, the grip uh, and, and, you know, f just sort of uselessly pounds and flails against the stone, but eventually realizes that if, if, it's, if its magical strength was not enough for Vago, then certainly its physical might is not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, eventually just sort of, like, relents and, like, keeps the hands on the, on the fist, if even just to, like, hopefully not get choked out, offer some resistance, uh, but goes otherwise inert and limp in, in Vago's grasp. Uh... Uh, and uh, what would what would would they even be forthright? Would they even be forthright? Um, would say something along the lines of um, well, we'll see, we'll see. So it's like this place. What do you got? <laughs> this place was empty when we came here. Um. If I remember correctly, Inside doesn't Casper have some sort of ability? <laughs> right, I wonder that too. <laughs> um, <laughs> doesn't Caspian have some sort of ability to? I don't want to say read people's mind, but it's like, can he? Like, I mean, I'm a con artist. I I know when someone's lying. Yeah. Do, do you want me? Do, do you right. want me to inside? <laughs> do, do you want me to inside check him? Um, uh, without I breaking eye contact with him, so I was gonna say, Caspian, is he lying? Um. <laughs> I like how I'm role playing against myself here. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, I got two. I have I have two successes uh, versus yes. Um, uh, Caspian, um, like hearing Sully yell towards him. Uh, re uh, lifts up his head and um, perhaps, you know, uh, because th he wants to feel useful somehow. He feels a little, uh, feels a little ashamed he couldn't have been more um, daring during their combat. Uh, like, sort of narrows his eyes and, like, reads whatever undead features are, are possibly visible behind the mask. And there's a, a, a flash of light uh, behind his, his pupils. Uh, and he, uh, he, like, sort of narrows his eyes and says, you lying sack of shit. <laughs> it's like what he says to the to the necromancer. <laughs> Vago uh, squeezes his throat a little bit. <coughs> and Sully's not even gonna ask the question again. She's just going to look at him and wait. Or Vago's gonna strangle him. <laughs> <laughs> um oh man. Oh gosh. Um Okay, I will say, I'm looking. I'm looking at my options on the map. Here. <laughs> um, says the ones that came here before, they were, they were necessary sacrifices to something far greater. 
uh, so shocked as an I am right now. Um, and I want to say she gets really close to his face and goes, what do you mean sacrifices? Say it. Uh, not to interrupt this very daring moment, but 20th OD just entered chat. Hey, 20th OD, welcome. To, uh, happy to have hey. you. Um, um, he uh, struggles underneath the grass, uh, underneath Vago's grasp. <coughs> to the north, there is a place important to our circle. One where we, we do our rights. We needed something strong, something of the old world <coughs> to empower it. <coughs> Many of your kind, they're gone now, but those who stubbornly remain behind, their magics are <coughs> of great use to us. Uh, at this, Ellie's gonna punch the wall right next to his head. Mm -hmm like with all of her strength. And I want to say that leaves like a huge crater in the wall, like pieces of the wall kind of go flying. And she gets even closer to his face and goes, are they dead? Did you kill them? Uh, and to seeing the impact, the the, the basically skull shaped impact of, of Sully's fist <laughs> uh, into the wall behind uh, him, the necromancer, um, you know, shudders for a moment and says, I, I don't know, I don't know, wait. Is someone uh, stronger than than I, wiser than I, uh, they're the one that conduct the, the rituals in in the north. They 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 captured the giants. They, they took them north. I don't know what's happened to them. You must believe me. Vago, what do you think? I think he's given us everything he knows. Do you believe him? Uh, I don't know if I believe him. Caspian will uh, <laughs> will will stumble <laughs> off of his uh, his his wounded form and uh, get closer to our friend here. Okay, okay. Uh, let me roll this. Mm -hmm. uh, and says, uh, once again, there's a flash of bluish light behind his eyes as he uh, he approaches the necromancer, still clutching his wound, which is somewhat uh, soiling his shirt from underneath his leathered hand. I mean, like it or not, he's telling us what we want to know. Whatever happened to your folks, it ain't here. It's up north. Vago looks back at the necromancer and just says, Is there anything else you want to tell us? Um. Yeah, my mind. Uh, like, are you implying, like, uh, about, like, defenses or something? Vago doesn't imply. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very true. Um, to this, uh, he says, uh, the necromancer struggling against Vago's grip. I, I uh, <laughs> your people, they, they put the bones in the ground, in the trees. Our masters found a way to, uh, to animate those remains, even so far beyond death. The trees themselves lined with the, with the dead of your ancestors, they... <laughs> They move to his whims. They move to his whims. Ooh. Ooh. That's cool. <laughs> um. uh. Is there anything else you want to tell? <laughs> That's all I know. I was just told to, to guard this place. It, it's a site of power. It, it, we, we were going to convert it <laughs> to a new place of ritual understanding, but we never got the chance. Um, Vago looks to Caspian mm -hmm. and over to Sully mm -hmm. and with sort of a look that says, do you have any more questions? Uh, to this look, Sully is going to say, 
one last question. How did you find this place? Our master is very powerful in the ways of magic. He can feel where the lines are drawn across the world. He's felt them fade for some time now. They're becoming weaker all across, but there are certain sites, certain ancient sites where the power still holds at least for a time. If they're draining, he seeks to use these places of power to, I don't know, maybe devour them for all that it's left. That's how we found it. He could feel the magic here even still as it fades from this world. Uh, with that, Sully's just gonna turn her back and walk away from him. Caspian? Um, Caspian, uh, hears this, sees Vago's look, uh, once again, just, like, kind of plops back down onto his haunches and, like, clutches his stomach. Do whatever you want. I'm done with that guy. Well. <laughs> <laughs> with that little bit of permission... Uh, well, I guess I should say this too. Um, who's who's the current controller? Is this uh, Amber scene right now? Yeah. Is there anything yeah. happening with the Magus in this moment? Oh, good question. Um, uh, I have questions for the Magus after what okay. happens next. Okay. Okay. But I want to say that he's kind of like you know he's I wouldn't say not fully recovered from showing us the magic in the cave. Like he was strong enough to transform into the bird, but not necessarily strong enough for combat. So he kind of hung back. Um, and he's kind of observing, and Sully, when she turns her back, she's going to walk towards him. The, the runes on Vago's body start to flare with that purple energy, and as they do, the art, the magus, who is perched on his shoulder again, sort of, like, lifts off and flies over to Sully instead. Um... And more and more runes just light up with that same purple, all sort of flowing up his arm in preparation for something. There's a little bit of, like, latent necromantic energy rising out of the ground, out of the water, all these places it shouldn't be, collecting into Vago, mingling with all that energy he stole, absorbed throughout that entire fight. And then all at once, there's this, like, <clears throat> as all of that energy floods into the necromancer. His flesh darkens, rots, disintegrates, and then all that is left in Vago's fist is a skeleton, which with Oof. nothing to hold it together just falls to the ground in pieces. So that's just a necromancing shotgun that you point blank <laughs> just made this dude eat? That's what, that's what I saw in my mind. Yeah, that was Gotta do something about that energy. Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah, it's true. Also, oh. point of order, I'm gonna I'm gonna retcon this just because I feel like we should spice it up. Uh, the master necromancer is a lady. I just, I think it should be a hot, sexy oh, goth right, lady. Sure. A spooky, hot, sexy goth. We lady. love this. Yeah. Yes, we love this. Ooh, I need to get a name, but he's dead now. It's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Twentieth uh, <laughs> Odisha, so, man, just use well, the fingers saying, of the mouth. You're saying the master really. necromancer that we. The oh, one we haven't met yes, yet. The, the one that you shotgunned, yes, was is dead, dude. But I'm saying the the master that he Done. implied ha was doing the ritual towards the north. That is a is a is a spooky lady. Lady necromancer. Yeah, into it. Hmm. Mm. Uh. So I think Sully's walking over to the to the mages, and uh, oh, he's on she's... your shoulder. Oh, he's on my shoulder. Okay, great, yeah. great, perfect. Oh, so, whoa, Mochi's in chat. Gonna... I didn't realize Mochi's feeding hey, beans Mochi! of taco, by the way. <laughs> yeah, eat the, oh. eat, eat the taco beans. Oh, I got to move the thing. You can't see beans, eat the taco. <laughs> I'll do it later. But yeah, thank you for feeding okay. beans. Hungry, hungry boy. And uh, speaking of, we would be remiss to not acknowledge this loaf behind you, Wolf. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wait, oh, is, there, is there a loaf behind me? I can't see it. Oh, 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 there is a loaf. <laughs> She just being a <laughs> sneaky little mom. Oh my god, baby. Little chicken cat. I didn't. I didn't. I. I can't see myself whenever we're streaming. Oh, hi, baby. Yeah, she's been there for a little while too. I'm like, 
<laughs> she's she's a very good gargoyle. She's very good at that. Oh, little baby. <laughs> um, I want to say Sully is kind of just like she's in shock, so she's not really like emoting very much. But she's talking to the mage, and she, she's just like, "Is there someone out there that can rival your power?" Um. Oh wait. Oh, who's the mage right now? I I just I just started talking because oh. I was playing everybody else. Yeah. I'm going to actually give it to Garrett. Why not? Nice. Sweet. Uh, the Archmage remains in owl form, but uh, turns their head to uh, Sully and speaks with their human voice. Um, it is possible, yes. Especially given the circumstances. We must be very careful about these things you don't um, say says Caspian as he's like wrapping another layer of bandages <laughs> around his waist uh, the, the mages' owl head turns the full 180 degrees to look behind at Caspian <laughs> and just says you are an eavesdropper aren't you <laughs> and just right back <laughs> Um, okay, um, so Sully is gonna, like, take a moment to kind of, like, digest that information, and she's gonna say, A lot of the magic in our world is fading. To have the power to reanimate a giant and long-dead bones. Does necromancy come from a different source of magic? There's a moment where the Archmage, or the Mage, is, is thinking about precisely how to explain this. Uh, but soon enough they say, Magic all springs from the same source. It is not good or bad. It is our intent that makes it so. Mm. Well, they sure had a lot of intent. I say as I keep wrapping my ways. The yeah. the mages does not deign to turn their head <laughs> to respond to that. <laughs> um, I think with that, Sully's gonna search her like you know lost home at this point. Um, and so she's just kind of walking around and like looking at stuff, opening cabinets, and I want to say she like goes into like this cabinet that's kind of like half broken off the wall, but like the things inside of her still some of them are still there. Um, and she grabs this, like, glass, um, almost like vial, uh, pops it open, and hands it to Caspian, and is like, put this in your wounds, they'll heal faster. Um, Caspian is not really much one to argue at this moment, uh, and takes <laughs> it and, and eyes it warily, uh, because we all know he's a little distrustful of magic, and probably even more so now that he was <laughs> nearly destroyed by it. <laughs> Uh, he says, I'll take your word for it, Sully, and I'll pop the cork and I'll, I'll sort of start pouring the contents uh, underneath the bandages from what I've already wrapped. Mm. Um, and I think she's just going to take a deep breath and go, <sighs> okay, so we don't know that they're dead, but we don't know that they're alive. Okay. Okay, and I want to say from that, I want, want to say my scene ends. Oh yeah, nice, nice, nice. So that would be back to Garrett. What's our time check right now? We're at 9.40. Uh, How we feeling? I'm good to go for one more. I I think the one I'm thinking of, I don't think it'll take long. Loki, sorry, I just, ha I just have to say this because it's in chat, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> when Amber said we Loki. don't know if they're alive or dead, said it's Shrotcher's parents. <laughs> oh god, that's good. That's very good. Oh, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. Uh, okay, uh, I trust you. If you if you feel good about uh, if it feel good about that one scene, yep. I say go for it. 
Um, great. So I think I'm going to invite everybody right now to head to the Rangers Road Ooh. in the mist. Mm. Oh, I, I moved Vago and I didn't mean to. There we go. No, I moved Vago. Oh. Move them. Hold on. Everybody come over here. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to, we'll get there. Yeah. We're traveling. Uh, so we, I think we take a little bit of time at uh, Sully's home to, I know Vago would take those necromantic corpses and get them off the, the proverbial property. Um, maybe tidy things a bit, put something in the sense of an order so that um, if we should find them alive, they'll have something to come back to. That's not, you know, stained with the blood of evil mages. Um, and then that done, we head further through the Mistwood, further through giant territory, um, and come out the other side. Um, let's say through another doorway, just like the, the first one we took into the hillside. Um, and from there, we know we are on the road to... I just want to double check here. I guess we're just further into the woods. Sort of bit of a uh, wilder territory. The the paths get a little rougher, but still sort of well trodden by somebody. Um, yeah. The mist still clings. It actually gets a little bit heavier as we as we go on. Though we know we're reaching the the other side of what we would call the mistwood. Um, and in a particular particularly thick grove of trees we hear a very distinct rustling from above us. Mm. Mm. Uh, Caspian, I, 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 like, what's the sa- like, this, what is the size of the rustle? It's distinct. <laughs> but if I were to imagine <laughs> something was rustling, you know, bigger than a bread box, what's, what's the vibe? Bigger than a bird. Okay. Uh, oh. It could be a person, or it could be a large animal. Oh, okay. Okay, so yeah, um, so I think immediately hearing that, um, I take a, a wide step, like, uh, I would imagine just, like, away from dead center. Wherever I hear that sound, wherever I imagine, I could be wrong, who knows. Uh, but I hear the sound, I take a step back, and I shing, so I take out the sword, and I brace it uh, in front of me in a defensive posture, and I cut my, my glance of the tree line. Okay. The moment your sword comes up, you hear the snap of a bowstring. Oh. An arrow oh. hits your blade, and it stings like you hit a baseball. Like, it travels down the whole thing and, and, and knocks it sort of out of your hand. Mm -hmm. And a, <laughs> a hoarse voice from another spot entirely behind us in the thick of the trees uh, just wheezes out. Don't even try it. Oh. I didn't realize I was trying anything. <laughs> Caspian says is like, <laughs> he like slowly raises his hands to either side. The, a voice from above sort of sighs. Uh, and just says, oh, Otto, you're so dramatic. <laughs> and then down from that tree, sort of like, like impossibly nimbly this figure in this foresty brown and green garb uh, slides down the tree trunk to the ground a few more figures make their way down out of the trees and from the forest around us and there is a, a group of about 10 humanoids faces covered camouflaged bows and like staffs in hand um who have clearly been there for a couple of minutes and we had no idea. Mm. Uh, the figure that comes down out of the tree takes her, ma her, her the wrapping from around her face and off of her hair, revealing just a, a wild sort of mane of gray. Um, 
she herself, I would say, is maybe 50 or 60, but clearly, like, in, in very good shape for protecting these woods. Mm. And she says, Don't mind Otto. He gets a little trigger happy. <laughs> and she looks at each of us and says, What is your business in these woods? Uh, at Not this pulling point, my Sully sword out, apparently. Like... <laughs> Not all at the same time. <laughs> uh, Sully's gonna step forward and it's gonna be like, I grew up in these woods. Who are you? She looks up and says, Well, that much is apparent, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I'm from out of town. Also a parent. <laughs> I am Vago, the golem of Raven the Hall. He just offers it. <laughs> um and I think the Archmage, uh well it's Amber's turn for the Archmage. <laughs> oh. Um Okay, do we sense hostility from 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 this woman that we're speaking to? Is she like, I would does she seem on guard? She seems on guard, but it seems more like, uh, not like if you say the wrong thing, you're going to get knifed. It's more like, what the fuck are you doing here? Got you. Okay. Um, so the magus, uh, is the magus still in bird form at this point? Or, are... okay. So I want to sure. say the magus at this point, it was in bird form and I think sensing that these people are kind of like from this forest and don't necessarily like want to rob us or kill us or anything like that, or just kind of it almost feels like protecting their homeland uh, from the opening, like you know, like where anybody doing in our forest. Um, he's going, or they're going to transform into their human form, like before these 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 people, um, and not even really introduce themselves, but just say. We're on a quest to bring magic back to the world. Immediately upon seeing the the patchwork furs and the antler totems and all of that regalia that just pronounces them to be the magus, um, the first figure drops to a knee um, and the rest of them sort of follow. And not only that, but each of them starts taking off their face coverings, their head coverings, to reveal their faces. And it's a whole assortment of um, sort of at least like middle-aged to older uh, humans, uh, men and women, uh, 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 clearly from sort of all different bits of the realms. Um, who just give immediate deference. To the mages uh and their leader um says i'm i'm so sorry mages i didn't realize it was you i should have introduced myself i am hester of the ray rangers uh, i think the mages is kind of like not not bow but kind of like give that like a head nod and say like well met at that nod, um, Hester rises, as, as do the rest of the um, the, the rangers, one by one. Um, mm -hmm. A few of them sort of cautiously start wrapping back up, just as a sort of, like, preparedness. Um, and Hester says... Uh, I'm sorry, what did you say that the, the mage said about the magic? Uh, we're on a quest to bring magic back to this world. Right. Hester says, is the magic gone already? No, not gone. Certainly fading. And we don't have much time. There's a little bit of a <clears throat> from the back and Otto, that first, that the, the man who shot that sword away with an arrow, uh, go points to the three clearly undead wolves trailing behind Vago and goes, What are those? 
And then I think the mage is gonna look back to Vago and be like, Vago, care to explain? <laughs> we met enemy who, who made these. I defeat enemy. I make these friends. Vago's real good at that, making friends. Until he's just Otto, like, Otto spits in the dust. <laughs> Not friends. Monsters. Uh, -huh. uh seeing Otto's reaction. Uh, well, first of all, seeing Otto's reaction, Caspian will like hands hands still up, slowly like pace back towards his sword. I can, you know, mine. I can pick this up now. We all. Done with the shooting things out of my hand. <laughs> you can try. Otto, stop that. <laughs> Hester, Hester herself reaches down, uh, picks the blade up carefully by the blade, and, and extends the hilt toward you. Thank you kindly, I say as I, you know, take it in a very uh, almost unintentionally ceremonial gesture. He, you know, treats the sword with a certain amount of reverence, uh, takes it, sheaths it. Uh, but then puts his eyes back onto Otto. You say, monsters, like, you've seen something like this before. I say there's been <clears throat> necromancers about. Yeah, uh, we Sully's might know gonna something come in and about say, that. Yeah, and Sully's gonna be like, have you seen them? Have you seen a group of them? Do you know where they are? Run into a few. They didn't leave us. I'll tell you that. <clears throat> and he's sort of, uh, his bow hand is really just sort of gripping and, and releasing like he just wants to put an arrow in these things. <laughs> Hester looks herself a, a little bit concerned and says, I hate to admit, but Otto has a point. It's not a good look bringing those with you. I think to this, Magus is going to speak up, and they're going to just say, understood. Um, and then the Magus is going to turn and walk to Vago and goes, Vago, would you mind if I put our friends to rest? Vago... Mm. Vago looks at the, at the wolves, not quite with the, like, you're about to kill my puppies look. <laughs> but just sort of, like, he has this thing, and he's he's starting to experience a little bit of sadness about it, and he doesn't really quite understand that. So it takes him a moment, and then he shrugs and says, if you think is best. And Vago makes a little gesture of his hand. There is a brief billow of purple. And the three undead wolves, one by one, just completely inert. Mm. And the magus is going to say, I think they deserved to rest. You did a good thing, Vago. Vago nine. Uh, and then with that, the mage is going to turn around and kind of just like gesture as in like, does this work? Otto, Otto sort of chews on his lip. Because he, he got what he wanted, but he still, it's something is not quite sitting. Um, Hester speaks up and says, that will do for now. But if you're going to continue in these woods, you may have to answer some questions. Hmm. Uh, I think Sully's going to speak up and go, Excuse me, how long have y'all been in this woods? The Grey Rangers are an order that goes back centuries. Our numbers change, of course. Eventually, we all get a bit too gray, if you understand my meaning. 
Oh, it's like a literal thing. Got it. <laughs> you are quick to catch on, aren't you? <laughs> but we, those of us that are here now, have been in the Rangers for, oh, decades, years. Varies from person to person. So, being in these woods for such a long time, surprised I've never seen you. I mean, I guess I didn't see y'all when we came here, so you're good at being stealthy. But have y'all seen any giants? There should have been about two more in this forest. Have you ever met them? Ooh, historically, we've given the giants... Um... I don't want to say a wide berth, but a res we keep a respectful distance. There have been some reports, however, of some larger than average creatures in our domain. They say giants. They've been whispering giants, Hester. I know what they've been whispering. But we haven't seen them with our own eyes. Giants. <laughs> uh, what's his name? Hester? Uh, Hester is the, the woman who seems to be their leader. Otto is the one who's a little bit more ornery Otto. and with the hoarse voice. Ah, okay. Um, and Sully's gonna kind of like look over to Otto and be like, Otto, what makes you so sure they're giants? <laughs> Gut. <clears throat> A most reliable source of information. <laughs> Suits me fine. <laughs> um, and I think the Matrix is going to come in here and say, I don't think we'd mind answering a few questions. Um, however, I think we could maybe use an escort through these woods. I think it might make you all more comfortable uh, that we're not just roaming and, you know, you know these paths better than we do. We're headed north. We would be glad to escort you, she says. As a matter of fact, if you would do us the honor, we would love for you to visit us at the Hall of the Woods. Stay Is with this us for... Where... I was going to say, is this where your base is? Are there more of you there? Oh, Garrett, we got you. Oh, I'm hearing a little bit. I'm hearing a little bit of Garrett from the other side. Can you hear me now? Oh, I can. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Sorry, one of my AirPods died. I had to switch to the other one. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, anyway, uh, the, the last bit I had was uh, Hester was just asking you to come to the Hall of the Woods, their headquarters, just to stay for a yep. short time. Yep. Um, and the Mages is asking, are there more Grey Rangers there? Uh, Hester nods. You won't meet all of them at once. They come in patrols, but yes. You'll see more than just us when you get there. Um, the mage is going to look to the party and go, any objections? Uh, Bago something tells me we don't have much of a choice. That's right. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, you lead the way. You just listen. Uh, and Hester wraps her face again, wraps her hair back up, uh, any of the rangers who haven't done so already prepare the same way, and they just fade <sighs> off into the woods <laughs> again, into the mist, like, completely. You do, however, hear, and it seems very intentional, one rustling, like, movement from limb to limb, sort of moving ahead on the path. That's cool. Yeah. And then I think that's the scene. Yeah. Yeah. 
Hell yeah, I'm into it. Excellent. Wow. That was uh, I th so we're gonna call it for the <laughs> then we're gonna call it there, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Wow, mm -hmm. that was an eventful uh yeah, set of circumstances. <laughs> um, so uh, so far, thank you all for sticking around and watching with us tonight. Thus far, um, so typically the ritual with uh with this game goes um. Oh, okay. Mochi, sorry, has redeemed uh, a raid. Uh, so we're going to head... Uh, whoever wants to stick around after the stream, I'm going to guide the raid to the next streamer after this, uh, courtesy Ooh. of Mochi. Thank you very much, Mochi. I'm saving that name. Um, but how, how this normally works um, in the... Rule set of the game is after you all have your session, uh, Mochi Fett says cross promotion. Oh, this is a friend of yours, Moch? Or for you? Is this yours? I didn't know Mochi had a... We'll find out, I guess. <laughs> but all right, cool. Cross promotion, we dig it. Um, how this normally goes is you have your session, you do your scenes, and then at the end of the night, you sort of recap, uh, you know, what's what's happening, what, what you liked, what you enjoyed, what surprised you... Uh, that sort of thing. So uh, I guess we'll get into that section of, of the of the evening. And wow, th there was a lot that happened this session that was very oh, yeah. surprising. Um, yes. What made you say? What made you say necromancer? That that this that literally that one line just became the entire arc of these like the <laughs> next two areas. And like I'm looking yeah. at the thing and I don't see anything about necromancer. So like it just you know very inspired. Yeah. Um, so what actually made me think of necromancy was I play a lot of Skyrim. And of course. In, in Skyrim, often when you're just wandering the woods, you will run into a random group of necromancers or a random mm. necromancer that will blast you off the cliff. And I was like, what better place to run to a random necromancer than the woods? Um, that literally was what I was thinking about when we were coming into, um, um, uh, uh Mistwood. And also by, um, by moonlight. So I'm thinking about like something that would happen at night. Uh, and I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't think necromancers would practice in the daytime. So I immediately thought undead. And then I was like, all right, I think this kind of works. No, I mean, uh, I, I I love it. Like I, that whole, like there's just so much that came out of that one line in terms of like building lore for this area and like the conflict and the fight scene that happened. Um, which, you know, is, is uh, it's interesting. The Rhesus combat, I'm actually thinking about maybe um, giving the enemies in between sessions. I'm thinking about rolling dice for them, too, to see if they level up, like their challenge rating levels up, Ooh. to see if they keep pace with us. <laughs> I think, that's like, um, I think not, that'd be cool. Yeah, like, we'll see. How, I mean, I'll play with it. We'll see how it works. I don't think it'll break the system. I mean, obviously, Rhesus is designed <laughs> to be more cinematic anyway. I don't think we're, like, meant to feel like we're going to lose a lot. Uh, but, I, I like, even how the fight played out, like... I don't know. I, you know, we played a lot of D&D uh, &D together and stuff, and so we we know how to narrate what's going down. But I I felt like that fight scene was, like, really compelling. It had, like, all these different arcs with, like, the magic, with the necromancers, and, and the you know, trying to grab for the sword. And, the, and there was just, like, a, it was very dynamic. There's a lot of really cool stuff happening that I could, like, very vividly picture. Yeah. I do like I, the, the freedom that this has, too, of, like, I got a couple wolves last scene. I don't have to, like look at the mechanics for my control undead animals spell and like if i want okay these ones are gonna bite these well like it's just like dark magic wolves attack yeah necromancy shotgun just like <laughs> whatever works that yeah. necromancy it's very shotgun freeing. was a highlight yeah <laughs> also also the um you know i thought it was um I really enjoyed the sort of yes ending of building out the giants kind of culture um, mm -hmm. in this spot because like, you know, obviously I don't have, I'm not the giant character. Uh, so like, as I'm the one who had to introduce kind of like the next going scene here, I was like very nervous, but um, I don't know. I, I liked that. Like I was throwing some stuff out there and we were like checking in, like, does this work? Yeah, that's cool. Like we'll build on that. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that uh, I, I like the idea that they, you know they do kind of have this like secretive underground. I like I like that you also mirrored it with the. I really like that whole magical key thing, the the motif yeah. that you established. 
uh, is really cool, and the fact that the key can open things that, like, like, I think at one point you even say, like, someone left the door open, but it was literally, like, the mm -hmm. lake being parted, and, like, mm -hmm. that's really cool. Like, that's obviously how Sully would think of it, right? But that's obviously, like, I would have no frame of reference for that. Um, so I thought, I thought the building out of the giants in the sequence was really cool, and, like, I think we have a much, uh, uh, I don't want to say a deeper understanding, although we do kind of, but like, you know, giants in any fantasy game can be so wide, you know, in terms of like what that means. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we're like, we're sort of narrowing down on like their aesthetic and like their, their, where they fit in the world. And like, that was very cool. Yeah, I think so too. I feel like what's cool about this is I feel like the giants we're kind of creating in this world aren't like your typical giant. They kind of remind me of like dwarven nature people, but like they're just large. Um, yeah. Which is kind of like, cool. Um, fear bogs and yeah, kind of like yeah. they're kind of like a yeah. fear bog, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought that was cool. Uh, something that kind of stood out to me for sure was Garrett. I noticed you being quiet in that scene where I was bringing uh, Caspian down, and I was just like, maybe like you know, Vago doesn't have a lot to say sometimes. So I was like, whatever. But the way I think you flipped it and where like Vago just wasn't following, uh, <laughs> I thought that was super cool. And I'm such glad a that play. Oh yeah, no, it definitely did. Because I, I wanted to, I, my initial thing was like, I think he would stay with the Archmage. And I, as, as yeah. that conversation went on, I was like, oh, this is going to be good. There's going to yeah. be a moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, no, and it was really good. Did you, did you always plan for there being an altercation there? Because like, I, I, like, as soon as Vago wasn't there, I was like, oh, of course he would stay with the Archmage. But I was like, what's the mm. scene going to be there? And then when we came back to like... Yeah. A scene of violence. I was like, "Holy shit!" Like, did you always plan for a fire? Well, that was the, the kind of the the chain of thoughts was like, "Oh, I don't think that if I was like if the archmage or if the magus is is like sorry, I've been reading Earthsea, so archmage <laughs> is just my go to. Um, magus, if the magus is like on the ground recovering and like not there, Vago has to stay. And then I thought like, okay, so Caspian and uh, Caspian and Sally are going to go berry picking." that's going to be and they're going to come back at some point and is he just going to like be standing there and i thought no something can happen what can happen dark mages we talked about it that's going to yep. be real weird if dark mages are like in this place where they're not supposed to... uh oh oh we just lost you garrett halfway through oh. <laughs> i heard dark mages though and it's true there were dark yeah, mages I <laughs> yeah you hear me again? Oh yeah, I got you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I was I was fussing with my AirPod case and my computer <laughs> freaked out. Didn't like that. Um, uh, yeah, and then it yeah. was too. I I keep coming back to those little prompts that we get for the scenes, and there was the the bounty we share for that one, and I kind of thought, well, if, can I make something like a bounty that we get? Is there something else we can gain from this scene? And then I was like. Necromancers have little minions. Yeah. Vago has dark Ooh. magic. Can we have mm -hmm. some little minions? Yeah. I thought that was really cool because I think we also all <laughs> made some sort of bounty in that scene. Like, I think Wolfie mm -hmm. gave the giant history, which I thought was super cool. Uh, then Sully was quite literally giving bounty with the berries and the foraging. And then, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with the wolf, that was really cool. Also, like, about the prompts, it's interesting, like, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to, like, look ahead and spoil things, <laughs> you know, for, for us too much. But, like, I think there was, it was cool. There were two moments, I think, where we were sort of, like, looking ahead and kind of planning the route. The first of which, you know, being that, like, I was so torn on what to say about Sully's parents. Because, like, I don't want to be the mm -hmm. one who writes the right. final pen stroke about her family. Like, you know, but I, but I'm like, but how do I keep it narratively interesting but, like, not, like, you know, just outright say they're gone or whatever, like, you know, give you some, like, sort of some narrative hook. Uh, and then, you know, you look yeah. ahead and I just see, I see a disturbing ritual, you know, I see all of that written in the in the upcoming segment. And I'm like... Oh, yeah, that was a good call. Well, shit. That like, was a good call. Let's lean into because it. Because I saw that, too, and I was like, are the Grey Rangers going to be up to some shit that we kind of, like, don't dig? Mm -hmm. And putting it as, like, something so close to their home base that maybe we're going to see some some necromancy that's right under their noses is going to be very exciting. Yeah. 
I thought that was cool. I uh, I did not want to write my parents' fate at all. I, I didn't think I would I mean, be able to have a good reaction if I wrote it. So I was like, one of y'all were going to do it. <laughs> but I love that it's so open because we'll we'll have a feeling, I think. I, I think the feeling going into it, too, was like, oh, shit, they're dead. Yeah. And the kind of openness of like, but maybe they're not. Maybe, yeah. maybe we were in the nick of maybe. time. Like, yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, look, like, how, in terms of, like, using the prompts for inspiration, like, um, like, the use of the Grey Rangers, you know what I mean? Like, them appearing, yeah. um, to sort of be, like, the segue into the next part of the, of the story. I mean, obviously, it's called Rangers Road, right? So even if you weren't even looking ahead, right. you know, but if, if you do, you can see that there's so much more fleshed out in the next section. So, uh, kind of seeding them early on to like establish who they are and like give us a reason to go there which once again we've already set ourselves up for because the circle is there um yeah i just i think that was like a really good uh, example of us like kind of using the map mechanics to like our advantage narratively to like set us up for like future payoff which is cool yeah which is something you don't think, necessarily I mean, get from other, with other like obviously this, you know, when you're playing like a role playing game, I, I, you could I guess have a map and do this, but not very often do you have like something like this where you have like a map and you have prompts and you have, you know, inspirational statements. So like being able to mine it for information like that is like very unique I think to this kind of format of game. Yeah. I do. The, the last thing I want to say is that. Uh, I think, you know, we spent this whole session in the Mistwood. We've had a couple where we've, like, bounced to, like, one or two places. And I, that could have very much felt like, oh, we're really just bleeding this for all it's worth. But we really, like, I think between the three of us, yeah, no, a lot there, of very was, exciting uh, things. And... <laughs> yeah. We used all available real estate. <laughs> in like, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, not literally, I think there's a space, but I mean, like, we, we made each moment matter, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, I have a question for Wolf. Are you yeah. disappointed at all that we didn't go to Stormguard? That's oh, that is such a good question. Um, I'm not disappointed because I really love what happened in the Mistwood. Like, like I said, I could have mm -hmm. never foreseen you dropping a necromancer in there, which has you know evolved into what it has. Like, because to a certain extent, like I did kind of have an idea of what we might see in Stormguard. I'd already been kind of in the back of my mind fleshing out certain bits of Stormguard, right? That obviously would change when, you know, it, it met contact with the party. Uh, but I already had, like, expectations, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And there's a part of me that's, like, you know, sad because I'm like, oh, man, like, yeah, that, you know, that is a part of, like, Caspian's history and character development that we might not see because I did have some cool ideas mm -hmm. for that. Um, but at the same time, like, it's really hard to be disappointed when, you know, we got all of the other good stuff that we got from from the Mistwood. So, I don't know. And I guess it also yeah. does kind of make sense that Caspian, like, he doesn't really want people to know about his past. So, at <laughs> least for him, like, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, I mean, I will say, you know, there's uh, some some now some Caspian lore that who knows will ever, <laughs> ever see the light of day. Uh, but I did yeah. I did really appreciate everything that happened in the Mistwood, I think, um... Like I said, I just I could have never anticipated it. I already kind of knew what would have maybe unfolded in Stormguard, but I had no idea what would happen in the Mistwood. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I don't want to spoil too much, but I looked at the map and I was like, I feel like there's a chance we could go back to Stormguard still. But yeah, I was I was thinking there are ways. Yeah, there yeah. may be. Or we could bring the Stormguard <laughs> to oh. us. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I uh, I think it's cool how we keep playing with magic and like what that looks like, um, and even the the Magus's description of when I when Sully was asking about like is there you know a different source of magic for the necromancers because they seem so powerful why the mages is so sick, um, mm -hmm. and it all being about like intent or what it was it intent that you that you mentioned yeah yeah I thought that the was a really cool concept. Intent. And I think that kind of plays on the world we're building right now, where there's this distrust of magic right now. And I'm like, maybe this distrust of magic is creating like this form of magic that comes from this darker place. And then that's why it's so strong. But I, it had me like thinking of like, why is the Necromancers, like, why are they so strong right now? And I thought that was really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's also interesting. I mean, not, not that we haven't, um, you know, played with this idea yet, but there's also something to be said of like, you know, magic that like, um, uh, what's the word? Manipulates and predicates upon death. Like, does it 
become stronger in a world that's dying. Who knows? You know what I mean? Like, uh, it leaves a lot of wiggle room. Uh, but it's cool. Yeah. It's definitely cool. cool. Definitely my yeah. intention. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I knew it. I knew it. I felt it. Write that down. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. This was a great session. This yeah. Was, this was fun. Yeah. Very fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally did this game. Um, for anyone who is still watching, speaking of this game, uh, this is Fall of Magic by Heart of the Deer Deernicorn. Uh, they are known as Hot Deernicorn on uh, Twitter. Um, what's cool about this game, uh, aside from the thing that you've seen, which is very cool, it's beautiful. The physical version is beyond gorgeous. Um, and another thing about this game, which I don't even think I, I told Garrett and Amber about, which is, but it is interesting. Um, so obviously, you know, you can play this game in the way that we're playing it. You start from one end of the map, you go to the other. I actually elected to buy their second sub-release for this game. Um, it's called, I think, Songs of the Axe and Fiddle, because the Axe and Fiddle is the name of the, um, the tavern we found in the very beginning. Uh, but it's interesting Ooh. in that it actually gives you different um, initiation prompts for the story and different um, like starting scenarios. Like There's one, I believe, called The Fugitive of Stormguard, where you actually start in Stormguard and all of you are escorting a prisoner to like a different part of the map. So like it yeah. completely changes, you know, the dynamics and that of the prisoner characters. Is Caspian. Yeah, yeah, essentially that is Caspian. <laughs> that's uh, the backstory. Yeah, that's we'll play we'll play his that's backstory. That's the prequel one we'll play after this yeah. one. Uh, but Love yeah, that. so there's, you know, you look at this game and you're like, oh, this would be fun. I could play it like what once and then I do the whole map. But it's like, no, because you can play it with different scenarios. There's also a back of the map. There's like different paths you can take. Um, very, very cool stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm very impressed with like how simplistically this is designed, but how like deep and complex the stories go. So yes, uh, Fall of Magic. Uh, I think with that being said, though, we're probably going to navigate towards the, the raid uh that mochi uh has uh, led us to so please stick around while i send us there but before we leave uh this has been level one adventuring if you're still sticking around uh i am one of your uh game masters and host wolf scott uh if you liked what you saw today we hope you stick around please like and follow us here uh like and follow us on all of our socials including our youtube which we're trying to grow and the discord where you can hang out with us and talk about all the games that we're going to be playing and planning for and hopefully playing some games on there with the community very soon. That's another another big plan. Uh, f uh, once again, shout out to Tabletop Audio for the sounds, Streamlabs, and Stream Spell for the elements. Check out the affiliate link below if you'd like to, you know, upgrade your own streams. And I think that is all the stuff that I usually have to plug. So I think uh, I think that settles that. Um, a Amber and Garrett, if you wanna if you wanna say goodbye to our lovely friends. Go ahead, Garrett. Take it away. Oh, sure. No, I'm just, I'm a all-time lurker, no-time poster. So just, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll see you on the Discord. Please come over there. And in the meantime, support these guys and their other endeavors. Um, my name is Amber. I normally play Nadara Valier in our level one adventuring D&D campaign. Um, tonight I was playing Sully the Giant of Mistwood. Um, and you can also catch me on Instagram or also on Twitch where I stream games sometimes, um, at the girl with caramel skin. So, yeah. Excellent. We love, we love, we love a solid plug. Uh, and with that being said, I am going to queue up Faith's, uh, I almost said Twitter. This is not, <laughs> this is Twitch. It's a similar <laughs> TW word, but it's not the same. Uh, I'm going to queue up, uh, Faith in the glitches, uh, Twitch. We're going to head there. And for all of you who have to part, we hope you have a great rest of your night. Uh, we will see you soon and see you on the disco. So, bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.